Welcome to today's assembly hosted by Executive Intelligence Review. We will not be silenced speaking truth in times of war. Since our last event on September 7th, the Ukrainian Center for Countering Disinformation has issued a new kill list, adding more than 20 others, including a head of state. A story appeared in yesterday's New York Times titled, U.S. Believes Ukrainians Were Behind an Assassination in Russia. American officials said they were not aware of the plan ahead of time for the attack that killed Daria Dugina and that they had admonished Ukraine over it. The first paragraph of their article reads, Washington. United States intelligence agencies believe parts of the Ukrainian government authorized the car bomb attack near Moscow in August that killed Daria Dugina, the daughter of a prominent Russian nationalist, an element of a covert campaign that U.S. officials fear could widen the conflict. Mm -hmm. Now, for those who are with us today, perhaps for the first time and may not be familiar with the Ukrainian Center for Countering Disinformation, here's a basic description. The Center for Countering Disinformation was established in 2021 under President Volodymyr Zelensky of Ukraine, and it is part of the National Security and Defense Council of Ukraine. It has a stated aim to detect and counter what they call propaganda and destructive disinformation. Um, and they if issued uh, as of uh, July of this year, a, uh, a kill list. Uh, and we have now, with the new revised list, which came out only days ago, 35 Americans are, in, are in, on the list, as well as people from all over the world, including, by the way, the president of Uganda, Uganda, uh, Yoveri Museveni. Uh, now, speaking truth in times of war has always been a risky business. Uh, some will recall that a year after Martin Luther King uh, came out against the war in Vietnam on April 4th, 1967. He was assassinated. Uh, prior to his, his assassination, his organization suffered tremendously, uh, financially and otherwise, but that didn't stop him. As he said at the time, there can be no deep disappointment where there is not deep love, meaning that he thought it his patriotic duty to do what he did and speak out in times of war. But let's be very clear. Uh, in the case of our assembly and the various people from all over the world that are on this list, we have all sorts of people who are trying to speak the truth as they see it, and they must be allowed to do this. Let's take, for example, our first speaker today, Colonel Richard Black, uh, retired, former head of the U.S. Army's Criminal Law Division at the Pentagon, and former Virginia State Senator, is a decorated Vietnam War veteran. He clearly thought and that he needed to serve his country as he did. And he's now doing that again. We're beginning with a presentation that he's prepared for today. Did US slash NATO blow up the Nord Stream pipelines? I think uh, most of you uh, are familiar with me by now. Uh, I'm Senator Dick Black uh, of Virginia and uh, uh, I'm retired Colonel uh, I, I fought in Vietnam in very, very bloody combat. I was, I was wounded in Vietnam. And uh, then later I was a, uh, I was a uh, JAG officer, finally uh, uh, served in the Pentagon where I advised the Senate Armed Services Committee. I testified before Congress and uh, had my division prepare the executive orders that went to the president of the United States. Uh, so uh, I have a I have a background. And I, I'm I'm a patriot. Uh, I've risked my life hundreds of times for the country, uh, but I am very concerned about the direction of American foreign policy. What I want to talk to you about uh, this morning is uh, something that was very <clears throat> dramatic that just recently occurred, and that was. Uh, the uh, explosive detonations that destroyed the uh, Nord Stream 1 and 2. But there are only a few nations that have the means of carrying out a military strike of this technical com complexity. Now, I was a uh, career prosecutor uh, and uh, 
So I looked at these things from the eyes of a prosecutor. You look at motive, means, and opportunity. So you say, well, who had the means to destroy the pipeline? Now, the Ukraine does not have the means of doing it on their own, not unless somebody walked them through it. So, so I think you can write out the Ukraine. Now, who had motive? You had to, you have to find somebody who's got the motive. Certainly, there were nations that did have the motive. Poland, for example, might be one. But there was no nation that had a clearer motive to destroy the pipelines than the United States. Uh, only the United States had the means, the motive, and the opportunity to destroy this vital infrastructure. Uh, President Biden publicly declared his intention to destroy Nord Stream 2 back on February 7th. He was speaking at a joint news conference with German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, and Biden said, and I quote, if Russia invades, again, there will no longer be a Nord Stream 2. We will bring an end to it. Now, the reporter was a little bit startled by this revelation. And she asked incredulously, he said, she said, but how will you do that exactly since the project is in Germany's control? And Biden responded, I promise you we will be able to do it. Now, this was quite a quite a shocking thing to say uh, that even though it was a German pipeline, Germany being probably our closest ally, military ally in the world. And, uh, and here's Biden saying, we're going to destroy the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. And you have the, the chancellor, the head of the, the nation that has spent many years and, and, and fortunes to construct this thing, which will have a, an incredibly positive impact on the nation of Germany. And yet he's standing there silent as President Biden is saying, in effect, that uh, if Russia comes across the border, that uh, he will destroy Nord Stream 2 pipeline. So in law, a, a comment like the one made by, uh, by uh, President Biden is what is known as a party admission. Uh, it's admissible in evidence as a party admission in a trial. Um, so we have an admission from the president. We have the opportunity. We have the means. We have an incredibly strong motive. Now, there are other nations that did have motive, as I mentioned, Poland. But the way that NATO operates without prior approval from the United States, there is no nation in NATO that would move forward with an attack that would have such profound ramifications on Europe. Uh, remember, NATO is essentially a creation of the United States. Uh, the organization is peppered by American top officials, and uh, even the Supreme Allied Commander Europe is always an American. So I do not believe that, uh, that any nation would carry out an attack of this sort without the prior permission of the United States. So in conclusion with that, uh, we have no explicit proof, no admission other than the president's own comments. Uh, but I just look at the likelihood. I've dealt with thousands of criminal cases and typically I, you'll call in criminal investigation division, the police, the FBI, the British bobbies, and you review the, the evidence. And, and I would often comment because I would have these gathered around me and I'd say, okay, looking at this, I've got a hunch. This is where we need to look. And in most cases, I was correct. Um, 
In this case, my hunch is the United States did it. The motive for it is quite clear. And uh, what's happening right now in Europe is that the European people have never really been consulted about the idea of sanctions on Russian products. Now, when you sanction Russian products, you're, you're cutting off the market for Russia, of course, but in the process, you're cutting off all of the vital natural resources coming into Europe and you're destroying the economy of Europe. So what's happening today is that uh, as winter approaches and there's a greater and greater demand for Russian natural gas, the people of Europe are becoming very restless. There are populist movements springing up in Sweden, in Italy, in Czechoslovakia, in Hungary, and, uh, and in Germany. And uh, I think that one of the objectives for the US was that these, these protest movements are placing greater and greater pressure on, uh, on the countries of Europe to back off from the sanctions. And I, I think quite logically, it, it may have been one US objective to say, let's just destroy the pipelines and that way the European people can, can rant and rave as long as they want. But if they say, turn on the pipeline and restore the, the gas, it can't be done. And so it takes some of the steam out of the protest movements. Now, anybody who thinks the CIA would not do something of this nature simply does not understand the CIA. Uh, they don't function in the best interest of the American people. Uh, their aim is to, to serve the boys from Davos, as I call them, groups like the World Economic Forum and all the other globalist organizations that are linked together and uh, have enormous profits at stake in these wars. By breaking up Ukraine, uh, by by creating the war situation and 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 knocking the the socks off of the Ukrainian economy through the war, uh, they are in the process right now of rushing in to buy up state-owned properties of Ukraine uh, and buying them up at a nickel on the dollar. The Ukrainian people are impoverished. Outside globalists, oligarchs have the money, they're buying things on a fire sale. They wanna do the same thing with Russia. And so I am most uneasy that the Central Intelligence Agency, DOD and the State Department have coordinated to destroy those pipelines. Like I say, that's speculation, but I think it's a pretty good guess. As winter approaches, uh, the people of Europe are beginning to wake up. And I hope that they realize they've been taken on a wild venture that is not only murderous for the Ukrainian and the, the Russian people, but it's suicidal uh, for at least the economy of Europe. And I hope that the American people will also begin to recognize that like so many of these military endeavors, this was a setup from the beginning. Yes, the Russians did attack, but the war had been planned uh, for many years and had been going on seven years before the Russians ever crossed the border. So uh, I think there, there is, uh, there's going to be a lot of news that will come out of, of Europe uh, over the winter. And I hope perhaps the Europeans will wake up and say, we're, we're finished with this. We don't need war. We're risking a nuclear war. And uh, it is time to uh, restore some sanity in Europe. Thank you very much. Is now.
uh, public enemy number one on the latest version of the Ukrainian Center for Countering Disinformation list. Uh, but there's a date associated also uh, for her and for those of us who've known her for so many years. Uh, on this day, October 6th, back 36 years ago in 1986, at about eight o'clock in the morning, 400 federal, state, and local law enforcement personnel descended on the on her uh, on her home at that time with Lyndon uh, LaRouche uh, in what was a sta uh, described at the time as an attempted assassination attempt against him. Uh, needless to say, he and she both survived that, uh, but they did not survive the prosecution that began after that, which General Ram uh, Attorney General, former Attorney General Ramsey Clark, described back in 1993 as what he called a broader range of deliberate and systematic misconduct and abuse of power over a longer period of time in an effort to destroy a political movement and leader than any other federal prosecution in my time or to my knowledge. So we have a sort of a, she's sort of a double threat. And for those that uh, might be so credulous as to assume that the fact that a New York Times story appears and asserts that the United States knew nothing about what might be being done by the Ukrainian authorities, um, the kind of injustice and precedent for injustice that uh, Colonel Black already discussed and mm -hmm. that we know very well uh, as a result of many things, including things like the illegal war in Iraq in 2003. Uh, mean that there's a greater investigation. Speaking truth in time of war and truth to power has been something that she's done her entire life. Let me also indicate that as the uh, founder of the Schiller Institute, she's been uh, sponsoring conferences around what's called a new security and development architecture, which includes, in fact, insisting that the war uh, in Ukraine must come to an end, that uh, Ukraine should not be a member of NATO and so forth. And I guess that's uh, more than enough to say about why she's both qualified to speak to the question of the list, the question of Europe, and the question of injustice in our time. So it's always my honor to introduce Helga Sepp LaRouche. Helga, you have the floor. Yes, hello. Thank you. Well, I had the good prescience uh, when we moved in Leesburg into a new farmhouse that I insisted that it should be called Ibicus and Ibicus Farm. And this is a reference to the poem by Friedrich Schiller, The Cranes of Ibicus, which uh, I can only advise people to read because it is a poem which uh, <clears throat> reminds people that there is a higher force of justice, sometimes called nemesis, sometimes called natural law. And I believe that the Ibicus principle uh, is uh, operating and eventually will bring the culprits to justice. Now, given the fact that today is this memorable, uh, not so nice, but memorable day of the 36th anniversary of the raid, I just want to uh, recall it because, you know, when you wake up quarter to seven in the morning by the uh, deafening noise of a helicopter flying around your uh, bedroom window, because that's what happened. And then we naturally jumped out of the bed and looked what, what was going on. And we discovered very quickly that there were these 400 FBI agents, armored vehicles, um, and you know, police uh, dogs, uh, armored, uh, armed people. Um, 400 people, this was clearly designed uh, to cause us to react in any way uh, to then have a pretext uh, to, you know, to get rid of us. Now we were able to um, to stop that by, you know, on the one side calling up the White House. There was cl clearly an intervention from higher people than those who had ordered uh, this uh, <clears throat> this FBI raid, uh, which stopped it. So we we managed not not to be not to be killed at this moment. But this was a really profound experience. And I must say that ever since my naive belief in democracy and the rule-based order, if I ever had such a belief, such a naive belief, was somewhat shattered. 
because what was the crime? My husband, uh, Lyndon LaRouche, you know, he was the most uh, law-abiding, peaceful, loving, creative person you can imagine. And what was his crime? He reacted to the middle-range missile crisis at the beginning of the 80s, which was the period when you had in Europe hundreds of thousands of people in the street because you had the Pershing II and the SS-20 uh, <clears throat> directed against each other with only a few minutes, five, six, seven minutes uh, launch uh, time, a, a flight time, and all these missile systems were all the time launch on warning. Uh, Helmut Schmidt at that time was absolutely convinced that we were on the verge of World War III and all the people in the streets as well. So my husband had uh, <clears throat> designed uh, something which is up to the present day the most advanced uh, design for a new international security architecture, which was basically a proposal to the Soviet Union that the United States and the Soviets together would work on new te technologies uh, based on new physical principles, which would be implemented together and make these nuclear weapons together obsolete. Uh, this was a very, very far-sighted proposal to overcome the blocks. Uh, he, um, you know, where we were in, in back-channel discussions with the Soviets for one full year. So it was a very serious proposition and President Reagan on the 23rd of March declared it to be the official U.S. policy. When the Soviets rejected it because, you know, the Ogarkov faction in the Soviet Union had completely different plans, uh, you know, then all hell broke loose um, <clears throat> because, you know, the relevant neocons in the Reagan administration also went into a rampage. And that was the crime that my husband had proposed something which would have completely changed the geopolitical uh, blocks uh, of uh, the post-war period. And, you know, he predicted <clears throat> uh, in, in 84, when it was clear that the Soviets rejected this proposal, he predicted that the Soviet Union would collapse in five years if they would stick to their policies. So that was the background uh, of this raid, um, because, you know, the idea that you would dare to have an idea to change the established geopolitical order, you know, was just too much. And, you know, then my husband had proposed another thing. This was a um, prognosis in 71, when Nixon went to the floating exchange rates by dismantling the old Bretton Woods system, he had predicted at that time that if one would continue on this monetarist uh, track, it would necessarily come to a new depression, a new fascism, and a new danger of a world war. And that's exactly where we are today. When even the European Central Bank is uh, putting out end of September a warning that we are in a very severe systemic crisis and you know we are about to see an explosion of a hyperinflationary collapse of the transatlantic system, then that prognosis of my husband is exactly, uh, turns out to be, to have been exactly uh, correct. Now, the parallel to today, and the reason why it was important to remember the raid, because this raid and the subsequent prosecution of my husband, which Ramsey Clark correctly called the worst one in the history of the United States, is to the present reason, uh, day the reason why his name, the name of the LaRouche movement, uh, is being slandered, you know, and many people are <clears throat> supposed to be scared away from looking at the solutions which would be, you know, the way how to come out of this crisis. Now, when it became clear that, you know, the negotiations would not uh, happen, which, you know, was clear after Boris Johnson had um, intervened in Ukraine in March, um, we called uh, the first conference of the Schiller Institute in on the 9th of April, demanding a new international security and development architecture, which would take into, into, into account the interest of every single country on the planet, being in the tradition of the peace of Westphalia. 
And we assembled speakers. Uh, we had conferences in May, in June, July, August, and September. And more than 30 people who participated in these conferences are now on that list. Now, we all we demanded was that, you know, if you continue with the present geopolitical confrontation with the idea that, you know, there must be a victory on the battlefield, more and more heavy weapons ruin Russia. Um, you know, just a few days ago, the Russian ambassador in, in the United States, uh, Antonov, Antonov, Want you know that this basically means that the U.S. is becoming a war party, and that this will have the most serious consequences. This is going to be the danger of World War Three, and we were mobilizing against that by putting forward a solution, you know, which basically would solve all these problems to so have a new security architecture, which would include Russia and China, to have <clears throat> uh, an economic uh, cooperation along the lines of the Belt and Road Initiative, the Eurasian Land Bridge, which was our proposal in 91. And it would also help the Ukraine, which right now is, even before the war started, in a terrible economic crisis. So all our proposals are really solution-oriented, and they still are absolutely uh, what needs to be uh, put on, on the table. Now, what uh, <clears throat> Colonel Black was referring to uh, pertains to that because the sabotage of the uh, Nord Stream pipelines, um, where you know now we have a lot of experts speaking out. We will hear from one of them uh, in this show. Uh, all basically say, you know, that if you look at the qui bono, the motive, the capacity, the opportunity. Um, you know, all that speaks for either United States or a country under the umbrella of the United States, like the British or the Poles or, you know, some other NATO countries, but that it is almost impossible for Russia to have done it because, you know, as uh, Colonel uh, Bosshart, uh, who will speak uh, shortly, uh, points to that you know, if Russia would have been able to, to do the sabotage in an area which is 100% controlled by NATO, uh, it would mean a capacity of seabed warfare superiority, which would completely you know, uh, shake up the entire assumptions about the so-called weak and outdated and old-fashioned Russian army uh, defeated in, in Ukraine, in the east of Ukraine. It it would it, it's it's really food for thought. So having mentioned all of these things, you know, I think that we have reached a point where, you know, the truth about the sabotage of Nord Stream Two uh, must be found. Um, the pipelines must be repaired immediately because right now, as a result of the sanctions, which you know the German people and European people never were asked about if they agreed with that, it has backfired. Uh, not Russia is going uh, bankrupt. Russia has completely moved towards the east. They are now building a new system together with China, with the non-aligned movement, with the global south, the BRICS countries, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So Russia is doing relatively well. But Germany, Europe, is about to crash against the wall. If these sanctions continue and the energy coming from the pipelines no more means that Germany is about to be de-industrialized. De and if Germany goes under, then all of Europe collapses. So this is not a joke. So the demand is to immediately start the repair of the, of the pipelines, including Russia, because it's a Russian pipeline, uh, in, in immediately <clears throat> uh, stopping the sanctions and going in the direction of a solution which can only be inclusive in international security and development architecture, reorganizing the bankrupt uh, financial system and you know, going in the direction of mutual assured survival and you know, not going in the direction of World War III. So this is a serious matter and <clears throat> we want to have the widest discussion about these ideas as possible. 
Okay, well, thank you very much, Helga. Uh, and for those of you who've just joined us, we wanna welcome you to our event today. We will not be silenced, speaking truth in times of war. You just heard from Helga Sepp-Labrouche, the founder of the Schiller Institute. And a little earlier, we heard from uh, Colonel Richard Black, uh, retired former head of the U.S. Army's Criminal Law Division at the Pentagon and former Virginia State Senator. Um, now, uh, our next speaker is Eva Bartlett, who I believe is with us. I know you're having a little problem there. I think she's there. Uh, she is an American-Canadian activist, commentator, blogger, and she is a wartime correspondent, from what I understand. I think she's actually on scene, and she's going to tell us all about that. Uh, so Eva, if you're there, we've got you. Okay, I see you there. Great. So welcome, and you have the floor. There we go. Thank you very much. Um, well, thanks for having me uh, participate in this panel. Um, I apologize for being a bit late. It's uh, not easy to be on time sometimes uh, here. I'm, I'm in Donetsk. I came here, I came back here on September 17th. And uh, at the very moment I was arriving into the city, um, midday, Ukraine was shelling central Donetsk. Uh, Ukraine shelling that day with 155 millimeter NATO caliber weapons killed four civilians, one of whom was still lying on the ground when I got to the area where she had been murdered. Um, two days later, on September 19th, Ukraine shelled uh, different areas of central Donetsk, killing 16 civilians. Um, I went to one of the areas where it was a, a massacre. There was nine uh, people killed in that one spot. Uh, their bodies were still on the ground. Um, pieces of bodies were strewn down the street. It was a horrific sight. Um, three days later, Ukraine shelled again central Donetsk, this time near a busy central market, also on a street with, um, with a streetcar, with public transportation, pedestrians, um, a church in the other direction. That shelling killed six civilians. Um, again, their bodies were still on the ground at the time that I arrived, about 30 minutes after the shelling. These were all completely civilian areas of uh, Donetsk. There were not military targets. This is not the first time, of course, we know that uh, Ukraine has been shelling uh, central Donetsk. They were doing so in August when I was here. They were doing so in June when I was here. Um, and Donetsk civilians are being terrorized. Um, I was just actually, the reason I'm a little bit late is I was meeting with a journalist I know who I worked with in 2019. Um, and he was explaining to me, uh, because I wanted to know, not being a weapons expert of any sort, I wanted to clarify, like, look, is there any, any basis, any legal basis for what Ukraine is doing here? He said, no. Um, if Ukraine was actually striking a military target and there were civilians who were injured or wounded in, in Ukraine's doing so, then that would be a different issue. But um, when Ukraine fires like five, seven, ten shells into the center of the city, that's pure terrorism. And so um, and this is continued, by the way, uh, post referendum. Um, I was just looking at some notes from uh, a local telegram channel. October 1st, um, seven people were killed in Donetsk. Uh, October 2nd, two people, October 3rd, two people, October 5th, three people killed. And that, you know, that's um, that's 14 people killed in the span of five days. Um, some days ago, around 6 p.m., Ukraine fired using the HIMARS system um, uh, missiles onto central Donetsk, hitting um, two different shopping mall areas. Um, thankfully, the, uh, as I understand, the air defense fired down uh, the missiles, but still there was considerable damage. Nobody was killed that day, thankfully, but it could have been, of course, a lot worse. Um, and just yesterday, I went to, to Gorlevka uh, with a couple of journalists. <clears throat> Gorlevka is north of Donetsk. It's a very hard hit area, and especially the villages around Gorlevka. They've been um, shelled relentlessly for over eight years. I had gone to one of them in 2019 and I went back there yesterday, basically, uh, and, and again, what I was told by the journalist um, that I was with today, what I saw, the remains of the houses that I saw in 2019, most of that has been destroyed by this point. So I, I went to the administrative building of Gorlivka and talked with the, <laughs> the head of that village um, to hear about the Ukraine's uh, continued shelling. And uh, what, yeah, I didn't go beyond, in 2019, I went beyond that administrative building. I saw houses, some were still standing. Most were in, in states of utter um, disuse, um, roofs blown off, walls blown out. One was still smoldering from having been shelled two days prior. This time I wasn't able to get there because it was too dangerous to go there. Um, I did go to another village. 
tried to interview people there. Most of the people were running or well, moving quickly through the town center um, because not because they were afraid to be interviewed. Sometimes that's the case. Sometimes people fear reprisals if they are interviewed by uh, foreign media. In this case, I was told they feared um, sticking around the town center because Ukraine shelling was so frequent. Um, and I drove around the, that town and saw quite a lot of destruction. Most of the people I saw who were still there were elderly. In my experience, elderly either don't have anywhere to go, don't have the means to go anywhere, or don't want to leave their homes. So they are being terrorized by Ukraine shelling. One man was standing in his balcony and he pointed to the fact that his windows were blown out and said he had just covered them with plastic sheeting and he was going to have to endure winter with that. And that's the case in many areas of the Donbass, which have been affected by Ukraine shelling. Um, I, I don't know how much uh, I can address in, in terms of like repercussions for uh, being observers of the referendum because I haven't left here yet. Um, I have not received any sort of emails as I'm aware that colleagues who came here to um, be observers of the referendum have received uh, being threatened with uh, some sort of sanctions or otherwise. I have not myself received that. I do expect being both a citizen of the US and Canada that I, I probably will. Um, but, uh, you know, I just want to stay, state from the perspective of, of someone that was here prior to, during and after the referendum, in terms of how the media has covered that, and I'm sure maybe this has already been discussed, I apologize if I'm making a repeated point, but um, we all know, I think most of us on this panel know that uh, the referendum was held in a very democratic and free manner, um, perhaps not the most ideal in terms of like there wasn't always 100% privacy, but frankly, people here didn't care because it was well known what they wanted, um, and that was to join Russia. Um, I was going around to different areas of uh, Donetsk, including Kivsky, which is a very hard hit area, routinely, repeatedly shelled on an almost daily basis by Ukraine. I went to Kirovsky, same situation in this one in Western Donetsk. I went to Gorlovka and I went to Mariupol. This is during the five days of the referendum. I saw volunteers from the voting uh, commission going door to door. And I'm aware of how Western media is construing um, there's a beep there. I'm aware how Western media is portraying things as, as people having had a gun pointed at their head. That was not the case. There were uh, local soldiers providing security, but nobody was intimidated by them. I was I started asking people, you know, is anyone coercing you to vote? And they would laugh and they'd say, no, we've been waiting for, for this for over eight years. So the, frankly, the way Western media is, is, it's not surprising the way they've been reporting on the referendum. But in my experience, people here were overjoyed that the referendum finally came about and they're overjoyed with the results of the referendum. Um, I did conduct interviews uh, the day after the referendum just to follow up and see, you know, ask more of the same questions. One of the things they would say when I'd say, like, what do you expect uh, jo having joined Russia? They'd say peace. That's their overriding will is peace. They want an end to Ukraine shelling. Um, and they also hope for some sort of economic stability, but peace was the overriding issue. And I guess just one other point I want to make, um, and I'm sorry I didn't have time to prepare a speech. Uh, I didn't have much time to do much of anything. Um, one other point I do want to emphasize is that whereas if if we're following some of the comments coming from people holding extremist views in Ukraine and how they view people here in the Donbass as subhuman, as expendable, as people they can kill, when I talk to people here, most people refer to Ukrainians as their brothers and sisters, and they just want they just want an end to this war. They just want they want to be stable. They want you know, they want their, their rights as Russian speakers, but they're, they're not calling for bloodshed. They're not calling for more deaths. They just want peace and stability. And it's a, it's really a shame, again, not surprising that Western media won't air this, but it is a shame how dehumanized people here have been and how their entire their entire narrative has been disappeared from, from the media's reporting on, on, on things here. The media implying things only started in February when we all know it started in 2014. Um, and they've paid very dearly here for not wanting uh, what happened in Kiev and Odessa to come to them here. Um, they're some of the most humane people I've met, very kind, very well informed. They, they have no um, disillusions about what's happening here. And uh, when I ask the question, because I know the way the media is spinning things, you know, do you feel like Russia invaded here? Uh, one, one man's reaction was like, how can Russia invade when we wanted to join Russia?
you know, and so there's such a, I, I don't blame people in, in the West for um, not understanding what's happening on the ground here, because simply there, there are very few Western reporters that will come here. They do exist. Um, any of the Western media that I have seen here, and I've only seen in, in March, uh, two French media channels, they were presented with the same information that we are presented with, but they chose not to report on it. So the it, it's on their hands, the fact that they haven't reported the truth. I know they have directives, but um, I'm, I'm very happy to be here um, and to be able to share my experiences with you and, and with people who read my work or follow uh, what I have to say um, on social media and on my Telegram channels and, and on YouTube. Um, so again, I'm sorry I didn't have time to prepare anything. Um, if anyone has a question now or later, I'd be happy to address that. Well, thank you very much, Eva. And we very much appreciate that you are, did get on. And uh, what, despite the fact that you had no time to prepare, I think we all were very prepared to respond to that message. Uh, you've, if you've just joined us, you are watching the EIR uh, event. We will not be silenced. Speaking truth in times of war. You have just heard from Ava Bartlett, an American Canadian journalist speaking to us from Donetsk. And, 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 uh, and, and uh, I, she just spoke truth in time of war. Um, our next, and we will be getting to questions. Let me just also say, because that may be of importance to people who are uh, here, uh, we're going to try to get through as, as quickly as possible with a few of the presentations and then come right back to questions and also cross discussion among the uh, panelists. Uh, the next uh, speaker is Dr. Cliff Kirikoff, uh, he's former st senior staff man me member of the U.S. Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. Now, actually, uh, he's on his way to Capitol Hill right now because he's doing some lobbying up there to try to see if he can bolster what is emerging as a kind of small but important response from a few, only a few uh, congressmen like Representative Paul Gosar of Arizona and a couple of others. Uh, and so he prepared a message, which we're going to play right now. Good morning. My name is Clifford Karakoff. I served on the staff of the Senate of the United States from 1981 to 1992, including several years on the Committee on Foreign Relations as a senior professional staff member. I'm now a retired academic, having taught at the U.S. Marine Corps Command and Staff College many years ago, and more recently at Virginia Military Institute and Washington and Lee University over the last two decades. The U.S. and NATO proxy war in the Ukraine involves widespread information operations as part of the combined arms military operations, as well as operations including psychological and political warfare to support the Ukraine regime and its present Western-sponsored post-2014 Maidan coup Nazi regime. The creation of notorious blacklists by the Ukraine regime now includes American citizens. For example, a seated senator of the United States here in Congress, as well as former US government officials, uh, including some from the Central Intelligence Agency. Although retired and not politically active at all, my name appears on the CCD list. The US government and its financial, military, and intelligence support directly and indirectly sustains and influences the information operations of the Ukraine. In turn, now American citizens are placed on the black lists of the Nazi regime in Ukraine. This presents a direct challenge and threat to the First Amendment of our Constitution and our rights under the Constitution as American citizens. Entering the Senate of the United States, I was sworn to defend our Constitution from all enemies, foreign and domestic. Congress passed the Smith-Munt Act of 1947 that was originally designed to protect Americans from the propaganda our government broadcast abroad during the Cold War. Washington's foreign propaganda was not to be directed against the American people. My recommendations at present are, one, 
Members of Congress should task the General Accountability Office, GAO, for a full investigation of U.S. funds spent in the Ukraine. Such an investigation would include U.S. funds supporting intelligence and information operations of the Ukraine. Two, members of Congress should task the Library of Congress, Congressional Research Service, CRS, for a full investigation of Nazi and neo-Nazi political ideology and activity in the Ukraine. What are its origins? Who are involved in its origins and who are actively promoting this in the Ukraine today. This investigation would include the eugenics and racial anthropology research in the Ukraine during the 1920s and 1930s, which preceded the rise of Stepan Bandera and other extremists associated with the German, with the German Nazi regime. Thank you for your attention, and I hope uh, we can all do something uh, about this uh, problem here in Washington. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kirikoff. And if you've just joined us, you're watching uh, We Will Not Be Silenced, Speaking the Truth in Times of War, sponsored by Executive Intelligence Review. You've just heard from Dr. Cliff Kirikoff, former senior staff member of U.S. Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. And he's also the president of the Washington Institute for Peace and Development. We're now going to hear from Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Bersard, retired from the Swiss Army. Um, and uh, um, besides the, what, we are, what we're about to hear, he is also an author. He wrote an article recently uh, called Sabotage of the Nord Stream Gas Pipelines for Once the Question Qui Bono is Not Sufficient. Let's hear now from Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Bersard. Being new here, I wish to say a few words about myself first. I've been serving 25 year, years in the Swiss Armed Forces, participated in an exchange program with the British Army, attended many courses and exercises with NATO forces, completed a one and a half year training course at the Military Academy of the Russian General Staff in Moscow, and served within the framework of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, OSCE. I lived and worked in eastern Ukraine and traveled uh, several times to Nagorno-Karabakh. In the light of current speculation about the responsibility of the sabotage attack on the North Stream 1 and 2 natural gas pipelines in the Baltic Sea, it may be good to rely on the facts known so far. Only the time and place of the events which have been anonymously identified as an act of sabotage are uncontested. Of course, there is currently no evidence of responsibility by either side and a truly independent investigation will probably never take place as so often before. I think that most of us agree that state actors must have been at work here. The destruction of a North Shore pipeline made of high quality alloys covered with rubble or sand at a depth of 70 to 90 meters, 20 kilometers off the coast is not for amateur divers. For professional divers, however, diving depths of 70 to 90 meters are not a problem. So there's a good chance that information on the kind of damage inflicted can be obtained in the, com in the coming weeks. Whoever destroyed the natural, natural gas pipelines must expect that evidence will literally come to light rather soon. The robust construction and difficult accessibility of natural gas pipelines in general, even on land, means that operators and authorities of the country usually refrain from monitoring in entire pipelines. In Switzerland's Armed Forces Command Staff, for instance, we thought about such scenarios and came to the conclusion that an attack on infrastructure on gas supply above the ground would be much e easier. On the other side, the water depths mentioned are a strong argument against the use of submarines to prepare the blast because as I was told in the Academy of the General Staff in Moscow, large submarines prefer to operate in much deeper waters, 
especially when it comes to presumably well-monitored waters like the Baltic Sea. The use of an unmanned underwater vehicle is surely the more plausible version. It is true, if it is true that the Russian Navy carried out a large-scale sabotage operation in the middle of a sea area surrounded by NATO countries and candidates, 300 kilometers from their nearest naval base, then the Russians would have made a real show of NATO. This would have been an impressive demonstration of Russian seabed warfare capabilities. The mere destruction of North Stream 1 and 2 would have been much easier for them on their own doorstep in the Gulf of Finland, for instance. It would have been much easier for NATO compared to this to destroy the Nord Stream pipelines. As recently as June, the US 6th Fleet, together with its NATO partners, conducted exercises just off Bornholm, in which unmanned underwater vehicles were tested as well. The exercise Baltops 22 could have been used as a test run or as a camouflage for the installation of explosive device on the natural gas pipelines. If, however, the Russian Navy succeeded in overcoming all the technical and tactical obstacles and approached the scene of the sabotage act undetected, maybe carried out extensive preparatory work there, triggered the detonation and departed again undetected, alarm bells should be ringing in Western capitals. In this case, almost every underwater infrastructure of Western European countries would have been under threat, including the gas pipeline, the Baltic pipe, which was opened a few days ago only, but also all underwater cables for communication, as well as numerous lines for electricity. This would then massively revise the image of the allegedly incompetent Russian armed forces that Western sources have been so fond of spreading in recent months, and at the same time reflect partly on the naval forces of the NATO countries involved. Currently, I'm asking myself whether we are on the eve of an unprecedented wave of sabotage against the offshore infrastructure on the edge of Europe, cutting off the continent from gas and telecommunications. With that in mind, I can only hope that Western forces destroyed the North Stream 1 and 2, because I don't really want to think about the consequences of a wave of Russian sabotage against our offshore infrastructure. With that said, I can end the statement here. Thank you very much, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Bassard. And if you've just joined us, we want to welcome you to our event. We will not be silenced speaking truth in times of war. You've just heard Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Bassard of the Swiss Army uh, discussing the issue of the Nord Stream uh, line. Our next speaker, uh, who was previously number one on the list, I think he was dropped to number two, uh, is Graham Fuller. Uh, uh, some people know him. He's a, a vice chair of the formerly vice chair of the National Intelligence Council, served as station chief for the CIA in Kabul. So he's sort of a notorious character who has nonetheless been at least temporarily demoted to number two on the kill list uh, for us today. But the idea is to let Mr. Fuller uh, both respond to and tell us what he's got to say. Uh, he's a veteran of these kinds of wars, and I think he will be able to give us an insight that a lot of people wouldn't otherwise have. So, Graham, thank you for being with us. Thank you very much, and it's my pleasure to um, talk to you today. Clearly, this is a major tragedy in, uh, at least in the West, probably extending to much of the world as this foolish and dangerous uh, war in Ukraine, proxy war in Ukraine advances. I think the damage of this war uh, are, is becoming clearer all the time and expanding all the time, simply because unknown, unpredictable elements are, are ever more coming, <clears throat> coming to the surface. First of all, I think I would, I would say, I think many people might agree, this, did not, this is a war that did not have to be. Uh, when we consider 
that there were discussions and negotiations for uh, Minsk II negotiations about how to possibly settle the Donbass crisis. Uh, ultimately, uh, this settlement, this negotiated settlement and diplomatic settlement was uh, rejected by both Ukraine and, and Washington. Now, apart from the terrible loss of human life that we witness both on the uh, Russian side as, and even more powerfully on the Ukrainian side, I wonder really what is being gained by all of this and what is being lost. I'm particularly struck apart from the loss, <clears throat> excuse me, loss of lives by the gross corruption of Western media and indeed much of global media in covering a crisis like this Ukraine war. We've just heard earlier from a correspondent on the scene talking about incidents that we really have almost no awareness of as we sit here in the West trying to understand what is going on. I would argue that as an old intelligence officer, I really struggle to try to understand what exactly is ha happening on the battlefield. Uh, forget about the New York Times, forget about the Washington Post, forget about most American media, and sadly, forget about now much of uh, even West European media, such as the, the Guardian, which I've always regarded as a fairly uh, balanced uh, and neutral source of information. We now find a, I hate to say it, but a masterful orchestration by Washington of international media. Um, I really, one needs to speculate as to why such a, a masterful orche orchestration of international media could take place. I think one quite obvious reason, several obvious reasons, but one is the degree of corporatization of uh, Western media in which most corporations, major media are very unwilling to buck the trend of what the mainstream lines of American policy are. Um, so I think this is, this is, probably one of the most major casualties um, of this war, apart from the, the terrible human tragedy. Uh, I, secondly, I, in my entire experience as a CIA operations officer, and I, I speak Russian fluently, I've dealt with Russians, Soviets more to the point back in the day, um, I have never seen such a vilification of Russia, uh, not only Russia, but of Russian culture, Russian people, Russian arts, um, anything related to Russia uh, that has been simply vilified for purposes of this, this propaganda campaign uh, in, in the war. This is indeed an information war, but it is very hard to hear what the other side uh, is saying, including even the Russian media, which is rarely ever covered um, in the West. I think we're talking about here also a mastery of spin and censorship um, of news, that, that any news that runs contrary to the established uh, narrative as the United States uh, seeks to, to, to present it. And now, worst of all, we see intimidation of those few alternative voices, many of whom are represented here at this meeting today, intimidation of these voices from speaking out with an alternative view. I don't want to say that this is an open and shut uh, situ situation of good and evil on either side in the war um, in the Ukraine. Both sides have their cases to be made and they need to be examined. But the problem is that anybody who attempts to, view, to address these problems in a balanced fashion is largely silenced, if not 
if not actually silence, at least they can find very few uh, media, very few outlets which will cover uh, alternative uh, views of this, of this crisis. I think this is extremely damaging to the future of Western, the integrity of, of Western media and indeed global media as we move into the years ahead when manipulation of information, we already know about this on things like Facebook and, and Twitter, but when manipulation of information by uh, major governments uh, really represents half the war um, underway. We also are now aware that the blacklist that has been created by the Ukrainian government, the so-called Center for Countering uh, Disinformation, is part of the major support lent by Washington and by the State Department in particular. Uh, I don't know about intelligence uh, sides. It's hard to imagine they are not involved. But in any case, um, in the mere preparation of a blacklist, which includes large numbers of Americans, Americans who have served in the military or served in intelligence organizations or other kinds of, of uh, major uh, governmental organizations, these are the people who are being now blackmailed, excuse me, blacklisted in uh, I think quite, quite shocking ways. More shocking is the fact that the United States government so far does not seem to feel it is necessary to respond to this, to uh, pull the Ukrainians back from this kind of attack on, on American citizens. I would finally just like to say about the more general damage of, of this war, as I say, apart from the human damage or even the information, information warfare damage, I think we are now witnessing a massive geopolitical shift with unknown consequences down into the next several decades. This geopolitical shift essentially means the exclusion of Russia from any kind of dealings with Europe and essentially suggesting that Russia's future lies solely in Asia. We already see that well underway with close uh, cooperation uh, and strategic, shared strategic interests with China. That, those interests are now being augmented by the creation of organizations like uh, the BRICS uh, states and uh, the, the emergence increasingly of the global South, which finds it does not have an interest in this, in this conflict and indeed views it as a fundamentally white man's European conflict, uh, it may be an extension of the, of the former Cold War. So the world is beginning to divide up into blocks which we have not seen uh, since the Cold War, but I, I think it will prove to be extremely uh, damaging uh, in, the, in the long run. Um, I, I think much of the brunt of this tragedy, uh, of this, of this um, upcoming disaster is going to uh, lie particularly on European states because they have now through US NATO policy and let's remember the EU policy, this is an important issue. EU policy, foreign policy is fundamentally NATO. There is no alternative European foreign policy. It, it all comes through the voice of NATO. Um, Europeans have now been compelled to close down uh, all virtually all trade of any kind through these sanctions with Russia. And the United States is indeed now pressing very heavily for similar kinds of um, depression of any trade between Europe and China. And uh, urging that, that Europe indeed join an anti-China coalition as well. 
So I think Europe, sadly, is going to uh, suffer most of all from this conflict. We can clearly see that coming in the uh, winter months in which oil uh, and gas will not be available to the Europeans. We have now this, this uh, pipeline incident, which several of our speakers have already, have already talked about. In other words, it's a grim prognosis for Europe and possibly the collapse of European economies and the deindustrialization of major states uh, like Germany. One wonders what it will take for European states to decide that this cost is too high, too damaging, too socially damaging. Already we have seen sh a sharp shift to the right within many European states in their, in, in, in their elections, in, in Britain, in Poland, Hungary, in, in Italy, uh, and elsewhere. This will greatly increase as the hardships of the winter, and indeed the wisdom of the present leadership of much of European countries is brought into challenge as to why they have chose, chosen to follow this path which, in which essentially Europe is the primary uh, victim of the uh, effects of it. So I fear we are moving into a really new kind of global, um, global formation of new blocks of power, which will not help the world in any way. Uh, it will be, very damaging and destructive to a global economy and really will end up with uh, a, a dividing line between East and West, um, Russia on one side and, and EU um, on the other, but essentially the powerful emergence of uh, Asia uh, under projects like the Chinese Belt and Road, which is going to exercise, already it's exercising major economic influence uh, around uh, the region. And um, I think Europe will find itself potentially excluded from all these huge benefits of linking uh, trade, trade patterns between East Asia and Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Graham. And if you've just joined us, you've just heard uh, Graham Fuller, former uh, vice chairman of the National Intelligence Council and also former station chief in Kabul for the CIA. And he's speaking on today's uh, forum, which is we will not be silenced speaking truth in times of war. Uh, what we're going to do is we, are, we have a, a, a few things. People have been asking about questions. We are going to be getting the questions. Uh, if you have questions, you want to submit them. There are various ways to do that. I'm not going to stop to identify that at the moment because we're going to keep things moving. Um, we want to hear now from Diane Sayer, who is a independent candidate for the United States Senate in New York, who's also on the blacklist, uh, recently did a uh, trip in Europe and has some insights not only from that, but in general, the situation on the ground in the United States. Um, and then after that, I want to just say that Colonel Black may have to get going. We'll probably give him a moment to give us any reflections uh, uh, after that and uh, then resume uh, our program. So, Diane? Yes, thank you very much. I presume I can be heard okay? Yes, you're good. Good. So my remarks really are sort of a, a warning or something that people like King Charles, the GCHQ, the misnamed American intelligence community, uh, and European leaders might want to bear in mind. Uh, you talked before about the principle of nemesis. Uh, I would speak about something LaRouche warned about frequently, the linear deductive thinking. And to give an example of that, um, you can think of a fellow who jumps off a 100 story building, whose intent is to see how quickly he can move. And at the 98th floor, he's going a certain speed and the 75th floor, he's going another faster. And at the 20th floor, it's really going great. And he's very excited that he surely is going to be able to accelerate into infinity. But 
when he gets to the first floor, something different occurs. That is, there's a singularity, there's a change in the space, and he ends, he has an end, which is not exactly what he intended at the beginning. And I'll give another example, a little bit different. Um, Helga may remember this some years ago, I think it was Mercedes that was trying to save some money on doing test drives. So they used a computer model to design a special um, discounted type of automobile. And the computer model said that the new steering system was absolutely fine. But when they put the car on the road, it turned out that it overturned if you tried to turn a corner going more than 40 miles an hour. Now, why am I saying this? Because you have people who have unleashed what they consider to be one kind of process on the planet, but <laughs> could very well evolve to something else. And, and we've seen many examples. People already have spoken about the backfiring of the sanctions. The sanctions that were supposed to crush and destroy Russia have not hurt Russia nearly as much as they've hurt the West. And in fact, they've propelled nations into working to establish a new order uh, along the lines of what the Schiller Institute had been fighting for for many years. We had what Dennis Speed began with, which I think is very interesting. I don't know what it signifies, but the fact that the New York Times has had to cover American officials saying that they did not authorize or support the assassination of Daria Dugina and that they believe that a faction in the Ukrainian government was responsible for it, I would say indicates another kind of shift then we have the announcement by OPEC that they're going to cut production of petroleum by 2 million barrels per day, which has Biden uh, very upset and he calls it very short-sighted, but perhaps he is very short-sighted in his policy. So I'm raising these things not to say that we are going to win this fight, to get mankind safely through this and out on the other side with a new security and development architecture as Helga has so eloquently called for um, now for so many years. But to say that there are so many factors involved in what is being discussed that you could equally well plunge into nuclear annihilation as you could end up with something much better. And it, it depends very, very much on what individual people choose to do. Uh, I think it's impossible to overestimate the power of speaking the truth in a moment like this, because you don't know which ears uh, your words are reaching. There's a certain dynamic uh, I, it's occurred to me to wonder if all the people in Europe are going to be so thrilled to be without heat and electricity in a very cold winter, and if they appreciate that their governments have had very little to say about the destruction of Nord Stream 1 and 2. And I'll just close by saying that human beings um, have an ability to actually know, to, to forecast. Lyndon LaRouche was a genius at this uh, science of imagining in your mind the various possibilities. We can do it much more efficiently than a computer. We are much more accurate than the Mercedes benchmarking process. Another such individual was Albert Einstein who conducted experiments on the speed of light, accepting we don't have anything that you can put in a laboratory except light itself that goes at the speed of light. But he was talking about trains going at the speed of light and things like that. And the hypotheses that he developed turned out many years later to be absolutely accurate. So what I wanted to contribute to this discussion today is the urgency of everyone acting 
in the interest of the good of mankind, because I think there is a universal principle of natural law. And I think we are seeing some glimmers of a response to our action. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Diane. And if you've just joined us, you're watching uh, we Will Not Be Silenced, Speaking Truth in Times of War. You just heard from Diane Sayre. She's an independent candidate for the United States Senate in New York uh, and uh, is also another person on the kill list. Actually, I think everyone we've heard from it, just to clarify for people that have never maybe been on a forum like this, been in this uh, sort of environment, everyone uh, that has spoken, I believe with the uh, possible extension, exception of Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Bassard, uh, is on the list. I'm not sure whether he's on the list, but he may be on the list by the end of the program. Uh, so what we're going to do now is give Lieutenant uh, Lip Colonel Black a chance to say something because his schedule is such that he's got to get moving, got to get going. If he's if he has uh, uh, any responses to what he's heard, and of course, uh, Colonel Black, let me just say, as of now, I think your the video that you did 36 hours ago on the topic that people heard it's now around about 300,000 views on our site. I know others are getting it around as well. So go right ahead. Well, thank you. Uh, let me just take sort of a global view of this thing. Uh, the question is why war in Ukraine? Uh, why did we create this? Now, I, I don't think anybody who seriously examines what has happened it fails to recognize that the United States planned this war long, long ago. Certainly uh, in 2014, there was a final decision made that we would have a war between NATO and Russia. And we did that when we overthrew the, the legitimately elected government of Ukraine, uh, headed by President Yanukovych. And uh, immediately thereafter, uh, we, we began flooding uh, arms uh, and, and building a huge uh, uh, Ukrainian army uh, to make war on the Donbass, which they promptly did, began killing people. And as, uh, as Eva mentioned, uh, they have been just routinely killing people in the Donbass. So it went on for seven years before Russia ever got involved in, in the conflict at all. So we, we deliberately, knowingly uh, forced Russia's back to the wall, knowing that they had no choice but to come into the war. Um, now, it's important to recognize some people, people have been sort of trained to believe that Russia presented a threat to Europe. They presented no threat. And I, I, the proof of this, I, I happened to stumble across it while I was doing some research. Germany, which at the height of the Cold War, when I was over there, they had thousands and thousands of tanks um, operated by the West German army. Uh, at the time that I looked, which was uh, before the outbreak of hostilities, I discovered that Germany only had 200 operational tanks. I mean, that's nothing. That's almost completely disarmed of tanks. Um, and so, uh, no, no nation is more cognizant of, of a threat from Russia than Germany. And it was clear from the number of tanks that they had in operation that they considered the threat of, uh, of an attack from Russia at zero, at nothing. And so why a war? Well, there is a war because the globalists want a war. They've decided there's gonna be a war. Um, uh, just uh, days ago, there was a massive, incredible protest in Czechoslovakia. Um, it, it had, they estimated 100,000 people. They showed photographs in the New York Times today. Uh, it, it was a, a very enthusiastic, very fired up protest, very large for a country like Czechoslovakia. And it was not the first. They had a they had a smaller protest, big one, but smaller than this one, and so they're they're gaining strength there. And a member of the German Parliament, uh, who uh, I'm well acquainted with, uh, Herr Beistrom, uh, who is a member of the Alternative for Deutschland party, uh, he spoke there 
And I listened to his speech. Uh, and while I, I'm not at all fluent in German by any means, uh, I was able to read the captions and I could tell he basically he was saying, look, he said, we, we have these protests rising up, these populist movements all over Europe. And he pointed to uh, a, a rather a shocking uh, turn of events in Sweden, where, where the conservatives uh, in, during the elections gained a great deal of power. Uh, the the uh, capture of, of the government in Italy by, uh, by populist conservative elements. Um, what's going on, of course, we know France has, has been involved for quite a while. Hungary, when, when Viktor Orban, president of Hungary was mentioned to the crowd uh, of, of Czechoslovakians, the crowd went wild. They just, they were cheering and jumping up and down. And, uh, but Herr Bystron said, our, our war is against globalism. And he says, we, we are fighting for, for God, for country, for sovereignty. And, uh, and you could tell it was a common theme. People do not want to be part of the new world order that was declared uh, long ago. It was declared by Herbert Walker Bush. And again, it was, uh, it was declared by President Biden. Um, globalism ultimately leads us to one uh, state dictated religion. They'll combine Hinduism and Buddhism and and uh, and Christianity and Judaism and and uh, Islam all together into sort of a pablum that they'll feed to the people uh, as as demands. And they'll they'll change the the religion and update it periodically. Uh, so they'll do away with all of the religion religion. They'll censor speech, which they're doing increasingly. They, they censored the president of the United States on Twitter for crying out loud. They blocked the president of the United States from speaking to the people. This is going on under the direction, the guidance of the globalists. They're looking for a global dictatorship. And I tell you, sovereign nations are crucial to freedom. The further power moves away from the people, the less voice they have. <clears throat> and the plan, I believe, the boys in Davos, which is my shorthand term for all the globalists, whether they're under the World Economic Forum or whether they're under all these other globalist organizations, their goal is to silence <clears throat> the voices of the people and to simply use the people as tools in their effort to acquire monstrous amounts of power, uh, and to be able to treat people as, as uh, lumps of coal that they can simply burn in the furnace or where they can store on the shelf, whatever they, they want to do with humanity. It's very dangerous. They're to the point now where they are risking and recklessly risking thermonuclear war. And I think it's very important that people rise up. I'm quite encouraged by the populist movements in Europe. And the one thing that all of humanity has in common is the need to have a voice. And I think that's why you're seeing the, the global South is rising up against this one world order. The people of Europe are rising up against the one world order. Everybody realizes that we have got to stop this monstrous force that is gradually putting in place institutions that will eliminate all freedom forever. And so I, I thank you very much for what you're doing here. Appreciate the opportunity to, to join you today. And, uh, uh, and uh, I, I encourage all of the speakers and all of the listeners to speak, to, to be unafraid uh, of, uh, of speaking your mind. You'd be surprised there are a lot of people who, are beginning to wake up in this country and around the world. So thank you very much, Helga. Thank you for all that you're doing, putting on the, the event today. Thank you very much, Senator. Uh, and what we're gonna do is the following. I see are a couple of people who have questions. I'm gonna announce them 
uh, Yulia Berg and J. Mark, M Michael Springman, questions or comments. Uh, before we go to you, what we have is we have an important figure. Uh, I hope he's there. Uh, he's with us all of the time, and he sometimes is, uh, I see his pictures up there. Uh, the fact that someone who has been a career officer of the CIA uh, is able to then embrace nonviolent creative direct action and then carry it out is something that is one of the more hopeful elements of what characterizes the best in the American character. I, he wasn't expecting me to say that. I just wanted to say that because Ray McGovern um, it has the same uh, role in my mind as Dick Gregory had uh, mm -hmm. uh, a, a certain kind of figure who like confounds everyone, um, but is doing it in a profound way, which then causes real questions to be asked. And so Ray is going to uh, say a few things and then we'll go to our questions and comments. Ray, good to see you. Dennis, can you hear me okay? Yes. Good. Well, this is like old home week. What a privilege. Graham Fuller and I <laughs> entered the agency at exactly the same time under President Kennedy. Dick Black is a more recent acquaintance, but he and uh, Graham have also have been part of the veteran intelligence professionals for sanity movement signing some of our more recent memos. Um, I want to say it's a particular privilege to be on with Eva Bartlett. Um, you know, Eva sort of personifies uh, what the title of this is all about. You know, wir schweigen nicht, we will not be silent. Sophie Scholl, another incredibly courageous young woman, younger even than Eva Bartlett, and not least Helga, who are arranging these things and arranging us uh, for, for us to be on this wonderful list where we are uh, vulnerable to being assassinated like some others on similar lists. Thank you, Helga. Why? Well, because Helga's arranged these kinds of seminars with people such as the ones I just mentioned, and nobody else has dared. Okay, So my hat's off to Helga as well, and the courageous women who often lead us, Eva, Sophie, and Helga. Now, I'm going to say something really politically incorrect. And I hope no one takes offense, especially those who live uh, in Germany. But Germany is the key now. We've heard about the sabotage. We've heard about the economic difficulties. We've heard about the, the, the Germans and others getting really cold this winter. And so I'm going to ask a question here that was the question asked by a young lawyer training to be a judge in Berlin in 1933. His name was Raymond Pretzel. He went by the pen name later of Sebastian Hefner. And if you get a hold of his book, it's a diary. It was found by his son after Raymond died. It's called Defying Hitler. And I'm going to read a little bit of excerpt from this because these record what Raymond Pretzel, the young lawyer studying to be a judge in Berlin in 1933, recorded at the time. And the question, of course, is whether Chancellor Schulz and Foreign Minister Bayerbock uh, are any different from the kinds of Germans we observed, more appropriately, that Raymond Pretzel observed in 1933. What Pretzel wrote was this, I will quote in English. The sequence of events in 1933 <clears throat> is wholly within the natural order of psychology, and it helps to explain the inexplicable. The only thing that's missing is what animals, what in animals is called breeding. 
This is a solid inner kernel that cannot be shaken by external pressures and forces. It's something noble and steely, a reserve of pride, principle, and dignity to be drawn on in the hour of trial. It is missing in us Germans. As a nation, we are soft, unreliable, without backbone. This was shown in March, 1933. At the moment of truth, when other nations rise spontaneously to the occasion, the Germans collectively and limply collapsed. They yielded and capitulated and suffered a nervous breakdown. The results of this million-fold nervous breakdown is the unified nation, so to speak, ready for anything that today, 1933, that today is the nightmare of the rest of the world. The question is, in my view, 77 years after World War II, have the Germans changed? I have been expecting them to change for decades now, in vain. Now, the gauntlet has been thrown down. Will the Germans accept what the US and UK are asking them to do? And the pipeline sabotage, of course, is key to all this and an incredibly important new element. Now, when Oliver Pretzel, uh, uh, Raymond's son uh, found his diary in, in Berlin. He published it uh, with the English translation, Defying Hitler. And he wrote a little poem, or he quoted a little poem right in front of that little uh, diary. And I want to read it to you. It's very short. It's by Peter Gunn, who wrote it in 1935. So again, this is the son of the young lawyer studying to be a judge. Pedagon is quoted. But first, the most important thing, what are you doing in these great times? Great, to, great, I say, for times seem great to me when each man driven half to death by the error's hate and standing in the place he's given must willy-nilly concentrate and contemplate no less a thing than his own being. A little breath, a second's weight may well suffice. You catch my meaning? End of poem. Now, I would like to transition just for a second uh, to something that was mentioned before, I think it was Ava Bartlett saying, uh, the 155 howitzers uh, that have been long been in the U.S. Army arsenal were, being, were shelling uh, Russian speakers in Donetsk and Lugansk. Well, I trained on the 155 self-propelled howitzer, but not, not in uh, the fall of 1962, so you do the math, let's see, 62, 60 years ago, okay? Because there were no 155 howitzers at the Army Infantry School in Fort Benning. They were all down in Key West, ready to invade Cuba. Now, why do I mention that? Well, I mention that because that shows how quickly, how short, how, how close we were to starting a major war the results of which might have precluded our being together here today. Um, President Kennedy, when he found out belatedly that Khrushchev had sent medium range ballistic missiles to Cuba, um, he saw that as a existential threat to the United States. So what did he do? 
Well, he, he did all kinds of things that were semi-legal, illegal. He's, he put in a quarantine. Most people think that was illegal under international law. Uh, he threatened nuclear war in a way much more specific than Mr. Putin has over these last couple of months. Now, I ask you, um, I don't remember anybody saying, hey, President Kennedy, this is unprovoked. This is unprovoked. What, what are you doing here uh, threatening nuclear war, uh, doing illegal things like a quarantine? This, you have not been provoked. I didn't hear anybody saying that because it was provoked. Okay. Now, why do I say all this? There's a direct analogy here. And it goes back to the existential threat, okay? And the fact that people, that uh, countries with power do not tolerate existential threats on their borders or 90 miles away from their border or 30 miles or right on their border, as is the case now in uh, Romania, in Poland. And it was going to go these medium range ballistic missiles, whether they're crews or whether they're hypersonic, were being prepared to go into these holes created for ABMs to defend against Iran. <laughs> these same holes can accommodate with a, the slip of a disc overnight, they can accommodate Hamagok, that's what Putin calls them, Tomagok. Tomahawk missiles, cruise, or hypersonic missiles when the U.S. gets its act together and gets hypersonic missiles. So uh, are you saying to me, you're trying to tell to me that um, this is not an existential threat? Warning time or time from launch to target was mentioned before. Well, on the 21st of December last year, Putin, addressing his very top military, it was part of the uh, military state of the uh, defense forces speech. Uh, he said, look, um, if these cruise missiles go into these holes in the ground that can easily accommodate them, well, then we're, uh, I'm faced with maybe seven to 10 minutes time to figure out, and he didn't say it this way, figure out whether, whether I have to blow up the rest of the world. Thank you very much. Okay. Hypersonic missiles, if they go into these holes, five minutes, five minutes. That's not enough time, okay? So what, did, what happened? As you know, late last year, the Russians came to us and said, look, this is unacceptable. We're not going to accept this. And look, just a little particular that doesn't appear anywhere, okay? Negotiations were to start on the 6th and 7th of January this year. On the 30th of December, the uh, Kremlin uh, made known to the White House that Mr. Putin wants to talk to Mr. Biden like now, right now. <laughs> and the White House was in a dither. Well, you know, we're going to start negotiations in less than two weeks. What is it? What happened? Yeah. Now, please. Now, now to his credit, uh, Biden accommodated that. They got on the phone and the readout specified that Mr. Biden, or they say Mr. Joseph Biden said that the U.S. has no intention of emplacing uh, offensive strike missiles in Ukraine. Okay, let me say that again. The Soviet readout of this telephone conversation on the 30th of December last year said that Mr. Biden said the U.S. had no intention of putting offensive strike missiles in Ukraine. Okay. Whoa. New Year's celebrations in, 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 in Moscow are never so joyous. This was a big concession. Long story short, what happened to it? Oh, I guess he woke up the next morning and uh, uh, Sullivan and Blinken said, did you really say that? <laughs> Well, yeah, uh, he seemed to really want me to say that. And this will be a good start for the negotiations. Blinken and Sullivan, forget about it. Now, I don't know that, that it exactly went down that way, but I do know that six weeks later, the next time they talked, Putin and Biden, on the 12th of February, the readout said there was no mention 
of this earlier promise not to put medium or offensive strike missiles in Ukraine. So what am I saying here? I'm saying that the Russians felt diddled, not for the first time, okay? So Putin looked at what was happening with the NATO-trained forces against Donetsk and Lugansk. He was in Beijing on the 4th of February, and he said to Xi Jinping, you know, I know, best friend, that you don't usually like um, uh, the violation of sovereign borders, but here's what's happening. We may have to go into Ukraine. We may have to attack Ukraine. And Xi Jinping says, well, um, you mean after the Olympics are over, right? <laughs> no. Again, I wasn't a fly on the wall, but that's how it worked out. All my, not virtually all my Chinese specialist friends said Xi Jinping would never, never acquiesce in the violation of the principles of this failure. Okay. But he did. He gave Putin gave him a waiver, okay? Why do I mention that? I think these two facts, diddled by the US, out of patience, and who could pick a stronger ally than China? I use that term advisedly, ally, okay? Now, that's how I think it went down, and that's what the American people don't know. And I'll just finish with this. I was up in New York for a while for our high school reunion, if you can believe it. And uh, the fellow with whom I was staying is very, very devoted to the New York Times. And so when I showed him the report yesterday that even the CIA thinks that the Ukrainians were behind these assassination things. And then I showed him that I was number six on the list. Wow, moving up. Moving up, McGovern, number six on the assassination list. He just couldn't deal with it. He just couldn't understand it. And there's nothing I could have done to persuade him. So we agreed to disagree. That's how bad it is, okay? Now, the last thing I'll say is that everything said earlier by Graham Fuller and others, uh, Colonel Black, uh, about the media, you know, the media is the problem. And let me just close with, uh, well, I mean, I just would say again that I compliment Helga and everybody else for trying to get through, to trying to make it possible for people to learn the truth, okay? When you learn the truth, then you can keep your freedom. I'm gonna close with uh, what I think represents the situation now in the United States and in England and else, elsewhere uh, with respect to, um, uh, trying to learn the truth. I'm quoting from Will Rogers, a, an old humorist uh, a century ago. And he said this, pay attention, it's very brief. <clears throat> the problem, the problem ain't what people know. The problem is what people do know that ain't so. That's the problem. And so those who have a chance to look at us this morning or, or to take a look at the tape, have, a, have an outside chance of being educated in a way that say, huh, wow, uh, really? Did Biden really promise to do that? Well, yeah, he did. There was no, there was no denial on the part of the White House. Uh, and they'll say, well, whoa, the Germans, are they prepared to freeze to death this winter? Uh, won't they wake up and see the obvious? I mean, Colonel Black talked uh, eloquently about the mechanics of the, uh, of the explosion, so did uh, another speaker. Uh, but, uh, you know, will, will, uh, will, that, will that change the way the Germans acted in 1933? <laughs> If the Germans can act as adults, <laughs> then I think we can find a way out of this, but it will be, uh, it'll be a new independent stance on the part of the Europeans who really haven't had that since the 30s, at which time they blew it.
Thanks very much for listening. I look forward to handling what other questions might come my way. Thank you very much, Ray. And uh, it's Ray McGovern, former CIA, CIA analyst. Uh, we are, I see we have a couple more people. By the way, you raise your hand if you have a question. We're going to get to that. We do have another schedule conflict, unfortunately. Sorry about this. But Helga's going to have to get going. And we're going to ask if she has any summary remarks to make. We will be staying and others will be answering questions. But Helga, if you're there, I don't see up on my screen right now, but that's what they are. So please go ahead. Well, I want to thank you, Ray, that you uh, said what you uh, just did, namely that the key is Germany right now. And that happens to be what I also think. I mean, the problem is obviously that we are still an occupied country, that we have no sovereignty. I think that when Brzezinski several decades ago said that all of Europe is just a colony, um, he was unfortunately right. And I remember that the, I think it was the Villepin, if I'm not mistaken, the French foreign minister at the time, called in all the French ambassadors from all over the world to discuss this outrageous statement. But, you know, nothing has changed to the better. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, one of the speechwriters of, uh, of President Trump, I think his name is Beatty, uh, just a couple of days ago said in an in a interview that, you know, the behavior of the Europeans at this point in respect to Russia doing what is demanded from them, from the United States and Great Britain in particular, uh, means they're just behaving like despicable vessels. And, you know, I must say, you know, I, I personally think this present government we have is the worst we ever had in the entire post-war period. I mean, they are bungling, they are incompetent, they are so ideologically motivated that they are about to crash the German economy against the wall. Um, <clears throat> that Scholz, the chancellor, was standing on uh, February 7th in this press conference in the White House on the side of Biden when Biden said, um, you know, that they that they will end the Nord Stream 2. And then when a reporter asked, you know, but this is a German project, how do you want to do it? Biden just declared, we will end it. And Scholz didn't say a mumbling word. I mean, what a chancellor is that when he came into office, he swore an oath that he would work for the good of the German people and protect them from damage. He has done nothing of that sort. So I think, you know, we are really reaching a critical point because, you know, if people understand what is happening, you know, the, there are some ulterior motives in this whole thing. And I think my late husband always would point to that, that, you know, it's not even the U.S. government or the British government. These are, you know, replaceable, expendable figures, as you can now see by this unfortunate woman, Liz Truss, who, who was talking about, you know, oh, sure, uh, pushing the nuclear button is one of the tasks of the prime minister, and I'm quite prepared to do it. This woman is now practically out and discredited after a few weeks only. So it's not the government's. What Lyndon LaRouche always pointed to is the fact that there is behind the scenes, an oligarchy, a Venetian-based or in the tradition of the Venetian Empire, the British Empire, uh, an oligarchy, you know, which now days is a financial oligarchy, who are the ones who are making these decisions? And from these layers came the order to ruin Russia. And Baerbock repeated it many times that she wants to ruin Russia. Uh, but now it turns out that they also want to ruin Europe. They want to ruin Germany. And, you know, I can tell you the situation here in Germany is extremely traumatic because if this is not changed in the short term, meaning to repair the Nord Stream 2, which probably will take several months, I would assume, and, <clears throat> you know, make an agreement with Russia to, you know, make sure that there is some a replacement in, in some form. You can always redirect a pipeline somehow. You can make it LNG. I, I don't have the technical solution right now, 
but get an agreement, stop the sanctions, get back to the negotiation table. And if that is not done, Germany will explode in the next weeks. Uh, because, you know, if you are lose, for example, the several CEOs from the chemical industry and other energy intensive energies just came out and said that the existence of Germany as an industrial state is at stake. Now, that means thousands and hundreds of thousands of job losses, bankruptcies of SMEs, small and medium industries and social chaos. So <clears throat> I can only say, Ray McGovern, I agree with you and I have some plans with you for Germany to save it. So I want to invite you to be one of the people who help me. Okay, so that's an official invitation for Ray and uh, I'm sure he'll be happy to accept it. Uh, we're gonna move into questions and answers. I just wanna say because Helga will have to transition at some point here into moving, um, helping to answer questions and be involved in it. I'm gonna have Harley Schlanger, another person from the uh, list uh, who will be helping to answer the questions. So we're gonna go to questions now, begin it. And then actually after we begin the questions, well, I'll introduce Harley because he'll be one of the people answering the questions. So uh, let's go, Yulia Berg first. Um, hello, um, I hope you can hear me well. Yes. Um, yeah, so thank you for organizing this event. It really is essential right now to continue speaking the truth and to continue talking about the uh, issues arising. And um, I think it's um, a very important side effect of any war that truth is being revealed sometime in, in quite a painful way, but still it does help to rebuild the truth and tear the masks down and not just the uh, COVID ones in this case. So I would like to make a brief um, comment on um, the topic directly related to the event and then um, ask a question which, um, I would like to address in the first place to the representatives of the Schiller Institute remaining here. So um, I'm also, as many people <laughs> present at this event, I'm also on the, the kill list and the sanctions list and some other lists. And I want to say that uh, um, what I see um, happening around those lists is that uh, the fear that spreads across the um, expert communities, uh, that spreads across uh, journalists, communities, and you know, other people is the key problem because in terms of sanctions, for instance, I don't see any direct effects on my particular um, case or my particular life, but I do notice that people start, uh, people start avoiding, you know, communication, avoiding, um, taking part in discussion events and discussion events are specifically what got me on all those lists, right? So conferences and, and public reports and this kind of thing. So um, once again, it's, it's a good reason to thank the organizers of this event uh, for the discussion that still continues uh, despite of all the threats, despite of all the fear that they're trying to plant around uh, the experts, the journalists, uh, the acting politicians and everyone else who gets on those um, kill lists and related ones. But um, one of the uh, um, uh, issues again that I see uh, right now is that uh, there is not enough, in my opinion, not enough of constructive agenda. And for instance, the, the, the Schiller Institute, again, has been one of those rare institutions that is trying to uh, communicate an alternative paradigm, let's say, uh, analysis-based, value-based, and, you know, uh, quite well thought through. Yet at the same time, when, um, when we talk about the current events and the threats that they pose and the risks of a global war and risks of nuclear attacks and many other ones, um, there is not enough of uh, alternative scenarios uh, being offered for a discussion by the expert community. So the question that I would like to ask uh, um, right now is, uh, 
what uh, do you think are the recipes for quality changes um, and what do you think can be done by the people, by expert communities, by uh, politicians and other uh, groups of people in order to promote those constructive scenarios based on um, collaboration based on uh, balanced approaches that uh, take into consideration interests of different groups and what could in this case be an alternative for the globalist scenario that we see unfolding right now. Okay, very good. Thank you for that. Carly, why don't you take that? Okay, I'll be happy to. Uh, this is, of course, the one of the major points that the Schiller Institute, as you referenced, has been fighting for. Not just a new security architecture, but a financial architecture. And it has a number of a, uh, aspects to it. But the most important is to understand what is real economics. And this is part of what's being outlawed in the discussion. Economics in the modern era is neoliberalism. It's the idea of corporate cartels imposing policies on the rest of the world that benefit the bankers, the financial institutions, the big pharma, the grain cartels, and so on. And we see this in Ukraine. Look, one of the things that happened after the fall of the Soviet Union was that the West made a decision. And by the West, I mean largely the United States and the city of London to go into Russia, go into Ukraine, go into Eastern Europe and plunder those countries, which they couldn't do during the Warsaw Pact period. And they, they did that. They lowered the standard of living in Russia, in Ukraine. And it was actually that destruction of the standard of living which led to the rise of Putin. Now, the, here's the important alternative. The Schiller Institute in 1989 uh, at that point, Lyndon LaRouche was in prison because they tried to silence him, but they couldn't do that. But he worked directly with Helga to put forward alternatives to the shock therapy policies that plundered Ukraine, plundered Russia and, and other countries. And those were based on what eventually became the idea of acting for the benefit of the other, which included the idea which has become now the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, if you look at the Schiller Institute website, you'll see quite a bit of work that's been done on this alternative system. And it starts with, with a, a simple point. No more neoliberal economics. No more international monetary fund conditionalities. Sovereign nations have a right to act for the interests and well-being of their people. And countries like the United States and the nations of Europe should adopt that as their outlook, as their policy orientation. And this is what the global South has been waiting for for so long and why they're turning away from Europe and the United States now is because they've not been given the right to their own economic development. So I would say the starting point is you have to restore the traditions of national sovereignty, the break with the idea of a unipolar world, there's only one model, and allow countries to work together through negotiation, through cooperation on major development projects. And, and Lord knows we need tremendous investment in physical infrastructure, in uh, capital goods production and trade. And this itself would reverse the collapse. Now, just quickly, as far as Ukraine is concerned, Ukraine has raw materials. It has wealthy or, or good farmland which by the way is being sold off by Zelensky to the grain cartels. Uh, but Ukraine also has a very important location along the trans, trans, uh, transportation connection between the integrated Eurasian economies and Europe. Instead, it's being turned into a looting ground and a battering ram against Russia. So I think the, the important thing is that we, we need the new Bretton Woods proposal that Lyndon LaRouche put forward, guaranteed by the four powers, which he discussed, that is Russia, India, China, and the United States, which together have the power to overwhelm the forces of the new empire, 
the city of London Wall Street empire of neoliberalism. So that's just a starting point to, to get at this question, but that's where the solutions will come from. Now, this is what the rest of the world is hoping for. That's why we see negotiations of a new financial system outside of the petrodollar system. That's why we see the talk between Russia and India of a ruble rupee connection. Uh, the Eurasian Economic Forum and Sergei Glaziev talking about a financial system which invests in the physical productive capability of the future based on investment in scientific research and development and in the improvement of the labor force through education, healthcare, and so on. So I think that's the where you have to look for the to start for the solutions so that we can avoid the kind of situation where a sole superpower can dictate terms to nations. And if nations don't go along with them, they'll be hit with regime change and war. Okay, well, thanks a lot. Uh, let me just say as we go on, because there's a lot of questions, uh, not that people have to uh, censor, but just try to sort of abbreviate and, and sort of focus the answer will be a little bit better, can get more in. I think the next questioner is J. Michael Springman, uh, whose name I recognize. So, but everybody else may not. So when you get on, Mr. Springman, tell everybody who you are and whatever you got to say there. I guess I'm unmuted now. Okay. Yeah. Um, first, Mr. Speed, I purely admire your comfortable cat. And uh, I'm glad to be back on your program I, with some old contacts, Ray McGovern, Senator Black, and a new contact, Mr. Schlanger. Uh, first, I am an attorney, author, political commentator, and former U.S. diplomat. And uh, what I want to do is make a comment to try and put everything we, we're talking about today in perspective. Uh, the United States for the past century has been trying to destroy first the Soviet Union and now the Russian Federation. Beginning in July 1918, Peace President Democrat Woodrow Wilson sent 13,000 American soldiers into the newly organizing Soviet Union to cooperate with the Czech Legion in destroying the country. Uh, later on, uh, after the Second World War, the U.S. Army Counterintelligence Corps picked up Nazi collaborators Stepan Bandera and Mikola Lebed and handed them off to the Lack of Intelligence Agency, uh, which began organizing uh, efforts to use covert operations and covert warfare to uh, try and split off integral part of the Soviet Union, the Ukraine, uh, and make it into a separate country uh, that would swore it would uh, ally itself with Germany. Uh, additionally, uh, after the fear of nuclear war uh, began to increase, uh, the CIA began uh, an operation called Aerodynamic, followed by QR Dynamic, followed by QR Plum, to essentially engage in propaganda warfare uh, in the Ukraine and in the old Soviet Union. Uh, as well as in the United States, recruiting uh, dissidents, recruiting uh, unwitting uh, Ukrainian authors, uh, and publishing a lot of literature uh, and shipping it off to the Ukraine and elsewhere, organizing uh, conferences and so on. Uh, later on, of course, uh, we saw the um, uh, peace president, Democrat Jimmy Carter, and his national security advisor, Zbigniew Brzezinski, the son of a no account Polish count uh, who organized another war against uh, the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. They recruited terrorists uh, to fight against them after they had lured them into the country uh, by disrupting the, uh, uh, the area uh, and then began to export this violence into the Soviet Union itself, into the Muslim socialist republics. Uh, in the hopes of destroying and, and breaking them apart from the Soviet Union. Uh, and of course, we had Graham Thor on. He was a station chief in Kabul who organized this mess. Uh, later on, of course, uh, what we see now, uh, beginning in uh, 2003, was the campaign against the uh, lawfully elected uh, Ukrainian government. And in 2014, we had the overthrow of the government because it wanted a better economic deal with Russia than with the European Union. And the leader, of course, in this uh, was uh, the great Obaminator, his Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, and Victoria Nuland, who is now the Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, the number three post in the department. 
uh, they organized a revolution in 2014, uh, led by the uh, CIA station chief in Kiev, uh, who used the name William Straub. And what we've got now after this uh, has been going on for, uh, I guess, what, eight years now, uh, with the uh, the Yuko Nazi government uh, murdering 14,000 ethnic Russians in the Donbass, uh, we have actually open warfare uh, between the United States and NATO and the Russian Federation, using, of course, the Ukraine as a proxy and probably killing more Ukrainians than Russians and destroying their economy. Uh, yet we still give billions of dollars and the European Union gives billions of dollars and NATO gives billions of dollars to this crazy person, Zelensky. Uh, who was a failed actor, comedian, and who played the piano with his penis on television. Well, so I, I think excuse, we really need to look that, at American uh, policy for the past could, century. Could, could, could you, because we have to move on. Sure, or, I'm done. You don't mind a statement, but, okay. Is that, is that pretty much it? Yep. Okay, because I'm sure Mr. Fuller and maybe also Rayo has something to say about that. Uh, but no, we actually thank you for the statement. Uh, Carlos Gomez, you are next. Please say who you are so people know. And thank you, Dennis. Appreciate it. Carlos Gonzalez, by the way. That's no, okay. <laughs> no worries. All right. Uh, okay. Wanna want to thank the uh, Schiller Institute as well as the uh, distinguished guest today. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, the conversation. Uh, a couple, couple of questions as it relates to what's happening. And the first and the foremost that I think could play a priority is that the uh, determining the, the the terrorist attacks in regards to the uh, the the bombing, the explosion of the Nord Stream One and Nord Stream Two pipeline. Um, the first is that you know what oversight committee or or what investigation uh, would be utilized to determine uh, responsibility uh, for that, uh, knowing that it occurred in international waters, and 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 likewise determining who is responsible how potentially that would change um, the current events unfolding uh, with Russia and, and Ukraine. So that's that's the first part. And then the second one is that, you know, obviously I, a lot of the comments today have dis, uh, discussed the information war that's occurring. And we know in specific that here recently, Elon Musk uh, really kind of forced the conversation on Twitter asking for, for peace, asking for negotiations. We know that Elon Musk, I believe, is closing on Twitter uh, tomorrow. And just interested to see if if uh, the thoughts in general on, on how potentially that could change the conversation away uh, from the the narratives that's being pushed because it unfortunately it looks like if you look across the globe it looks like the majority of political people uh, are really backing Ukraine even the newly elected um, uh, in, in Italy um, Maloney was was again just saying hey I have full support for Ukraine so it looks like politically unfortunately it doesn't look like there's a solution to this. Uh, so what what are the, uh, the 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 distinguished speakers thoughts on those uh, questions? I think what I'm going to ask here is for Harley to start, but I want to also have either Ray, Ray and or Graham respond both to the last thing we heard and also to this. So Harley, why don't you get us started? Then we'll go to Ray and to Graham. Uh, you seem to be muted. Yeah. OK, I think Ray and Graham would be better suited to answer the question about the investigation. Obviously, you can't have NATO do an investigation. Uh, at this point, it's questionable whether the United Nations would, would be uh, reliable. We also saw the International Atomic Energy Agency punt on the whole question of the shelling of the Zaporizhia nuclear plant. So the international agencies that in the past would look into this most of them are, at this point at least, in the pocket of NATO and the United States. But if you are going to have an honest investigation, it should include the Russians. And it should include the Germans. And the Germans certainly have engineering technology and capabilities to do that. So I, I, I'll leave a further delineation of that to either Ray or, or Graham. On Musk and the, the search for peace, look, there are very few people who have the courage to challenge these narratives. And by challenging them, I mean not just identifying the problem, but the solution. What always distinguished Lyndon LaRouche was he was never afraid to name the names of the people he thought responsible. And he engaged in intensive investigation, both on a historical and scientific standpoint and philosophical standpoint to identify the problems. Now, how many people do that in, in the world today? 
And with all due respect to Elon Musk, you know, I'm not sure that, that uh, I wish him the best of luck in getting his peace initiative going. But unless he's willing to overturn some of the sacred cows, including uh, the identification of the, the modern British empire as at the center of these operations, uh, it won't get very far. But I, I think I can say in, uh, on what Carlos is asking, I wouldn't be so sure that the Italian government is gonna end up supporting Ukraine and NATO. I think what we're seeing in the vote in Italy, a vote last weekend in Bulgaria, uh, which defeated a very strong pro-NATO uh, government, I think we're seeing the people beginning to march and start to change the subject and get to this question of what does it mean to be a sovereign nation? And that's where we come in. That's where the, the people come in. And what we're fighting for is to have as many people as possible engaged in the discussion. And the reason for groups like the Committee to Combat Disinformation and Mirotvarets is to intimidate people, to terrorize people, to be afraid to speak and to talk about these deeper, more profound issues. Those who are on this panel and others by speaking out are encouraging others to get involved. And perhaps we can then move leaders of countries to recognize that their people are going in a different direction. So let me leave it at that. I, yeah, let me, before we go to Ray and then I guess to Graham uh, is just in, in, indicate, I think Mira Tarada is also with us, the chairwoman of Foundation to Battle Injustice. We also had a video that we had to play from her. We're gonna do that after these answers. So just wanted to say that. Go ahead, uh, Ray, if you're going to Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, uh, the UN is in the US pocket, pure and simple. Uh, the Russians and the Chinese still give lip service to the functions that the UN should be performing. But you know, back in the day, and this will be very brief, <clears throat> weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, yellow cake uranium from deepest Africa, the last head of the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency of the UN, El Baradai, uh, told the UN Security Council, it took us only one day to find out that reports of yellow cake were not authentic. <laughs> Forged, all right? Now, there's a story there because he was replaced by a Japanese diplomat called Amano. And we know from WikiLeaks cables that Amato thanked the U.S. so much for getting him into that position as head of the IAEA. And he said, oh, and by the way, I'm running out of little funds. I'd like to have no drapes in my office. And you think you could help on that? It's in the WikiLeaks cable. So that's where it all kind of started. Uh, El Baradai spoke the truth. That's not permitted. So in the U.S. pocket, yes. Zaporozhye was mentioned. They send the delegation down. They can't get through to Zaporozhye because of the Ukrainian shelling. They get on site and then they still shell and they can't figure out, well, where are they coming from? They're coming from across the river, but where is that? You know, it, <laughs> coming from Ukrainian shelling, for God's sake. The other thing, of course, is chemical, uh, chemical weapons use uh, blamed on the Syrian government shown three times now to be a total charade, charade, as they say, okay? So the UN is beyond repair in terms of these kinds of investigations. Uh, it will never, uh, in my view, they will never permit the Russians to have the kind of role that they should have witness their exclusion from the MH17 investigation, you know, that they shoot down of the uh, Ukraine, of the, uh, uh, the Malaysian plane there in July of 2014. So, you know, as long as the UN is under the US thumb, I don't think the Russians really expect any help from it. It will be probably left in this another level land of he said and she said, but he said, 
has a lot more substance to it because it's logical. She said has no substance at all because it doesn't make any sense. Okay. Graham, you have anything that you'd like to add? Are you there? We're not hearing you, Graham, if you're adding. Okay, I don't see him. Uh, by the way, I'll just make sure. Is he there? No? Uh, so just one observation before we, so we should go to uh, the uh, video that we have uh, from Mira Tirada. Uh, Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, is that you, Graham? Yeah, sorry. Great, go. Yeah. Um, Ray raises a very interesting point about whether the UN is totally under uh, a US control uh, or not, and as to whether it would be able to functionally uh, get to the bottom, no pun intended, of this uh, pipeline hmm. incident. Um, I'm not sure I am quite as pessimistic as Ray is on this in the sense that I think, first of all, we've been talking about the, the, the war for control of narrative and control of information. I think by now, uh, simply on the basis of cui bono, who benefits mainly primarily from such an incident, that most of the world at this point has really come around to the point of view that it probably was the United States. This is not necessarily an informed view. I'm not even saying it's absolutely accurate, but I think the role of public opinion as we watch this thing unfold and who benefits from it will not leave the United States in a very comfortable position. And secondly, I'm hopeful, uh, Ray also raised some uh, more disturbing uh, commentary on the nature of German society than I quite would. I'd have to say for years, in any case, I, I did have some hope that Europe, excuse me, that Germany might be the only voice of sanity um, across um, a Europe with, with France occasionally kicking in usefully. But I've lost that uh, sense of optimism now. But I wonder again whether when the cold weather sets in and the hardships and collapse of the economy and everything else, that there may not be much deeper exploration of all that took place in this that will leave, leave us with perhaps a little better idea of who might have been involved in, in, this, in, this, uh, in this ugly incident. Finally, just let me quickly uh, make a comment um, that um, about my own professional background in this case. Yes, I was chief of station in Kabul. However, I was not there. I, I left. I was there from 75 to 78. I witnessed the communist takeover of the country by, uh, by the communist uh, oriented air force at the time. But I was not there during any of the period of the um, uh, organization of Mujahideen against uh, the Soviet Union. I should also point out, I think we have to have a little bit of historical perspective on this. I, the Cold War, I think, was a significantly different period than the contemporary situation of the, of the world today. Um, there were very clearly two global blocks, sadly, uh, uh, the world was divided along these lines, um, and it was sort of a no-holds-barred uh, conflict between the between Soviet Union and the United States, or Soviet Union and the West. So uh, I think the values and standards by which the world operated and dealt with other countries in that period was probably significantly different. I'm, I'm not defending it all. I, I, there were many egregious uh, aspects of, of the Cold War on both sides. But I think now we our expectations are higher. These huge bipolar blocks of the world have fallen apart. And we're looking with some hope and uh, aspirations towards a better world. Uh, and, and, and as several of our speakers have, have, have said, a, uh, a less globalized world and a more 
uh, a world in which uh, sovereignty plays far greater role. I'm hopeful that that kind of a world will make it more difficult for a split along uh, global lines as we uh, had back in the Cold War days. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. So let's go to the, and this is in part done as a way of sort of reintroducing the themes that we had at the beginning, not that we've been away from them, but I just wanna make sure that we have to um, make sure that we, we, we do that. So we have the, uh, in this, uh, this from uh, Mira Tirada, the chairwoman of the Foundation to Battle Injustice, uh, followed by a uh, statement also from uh, another contributor, uh, Mr. David Pine. Death threats, blacklists, and Russophobia. How Ukraine and the NATO countries of Eastern Europe enforce non-legal practices to the world. Despite the fact that the Foundation to Battle Injustice, the Schiller Institute, and all of you, dear colleagues, attracted international attention to the problem of the Miratvoritz and caused its condemnation, the website continues to function as before and bring considerable public harm. Literally every day, nationalists put the data of thousands of people, including adults and children, politicians and public figures, clergy and teachers, into open access. The fact that people whose personal data was published on Miratvoritz received threats on the internet, and some of them even faced violence in real life, was said repeatedly and unable, sadly, to surprise anymore. The administrators and uh, instructors of the Miratvoris don't even think to stop their criminal activities because of which journalists are still suffering nowadays. In mid-September, Italian journalist Mattia Sorbi, whose personal data was published on Miratvoris, almost became another victim of Ukrainian nationalists. Having arrived in Ukraine to fulfill his professional duty, Sorbi, accompanied by two armed forces of Ukraine soldiers, went to the advanced positions of the Ukrainian troops. After a while, the escort left the car, the press representative the way to go. A few meters later, the car with the journalist was blown up. As it turned out, the road was mined. Matthias Sorbi was taken to the hospital by Russian servicemen. His life was saved. Presumably, the Ukrainian serviceman tried to eliminate the journalist according to Miratvoritz information, who accuses him of anti-Ukrainian propaganda. In early October, French journalist Adrian Bouquet, like his Italian colleague, almost became another victim of Ukrainian nationalists. A war correspondent who saw with his own eyes how in the spring the AFU fighters brought the bodies of dead people and laid them out on the streets of Bucha, thereby revealing the truth about the staging of the AFU, was attacked in Istanbul. The journalist is convinced that he became the target of an attack by unknown people because of his activities, which exposed the propaganda of Kyiv. The work of the nationalist website inspired the Ukrainian government to create the so-called Center for Countering Disinformation, which was opened in March 2021 by decree of the Ukrainian president. This center positions itself as an organization created to combat current and predictable threats to national security and national interests of Ukraine in the information sphere, but in fact it's a legalized and recognized copy of the Miratvoritz website. The Center for Countering Disinformation does not shy to use loud expressions accusing foreign journalists and public figures of pro-Russian propaganda. It's obvious that the center was created with one sole purpose, to manipulate the consciousness of Ukrainians trying to provoke aggression from them toward everyone who does not agree with Kiev's position. In combination with the Miratvoris, which contains personal information about some of those who are recognized by the Center for Countering Disinformation as a Russian agent, there is an additional approved at the state level risk to the life and safety of public figures criticizing Kyiv. The Ukrainian state resource is trying to provoke aggression against well-known public figures, probably trying to attract the attention of their audience. John Mershmeyer. Tucker Carson, Eva Bartlett, Glenn Greenwald, Steven Seagal, and Roger Waters, all those persons are accused of broadcasting an agenda that goes against the position of Kyiv. And there is many more. 
Russophobia is far from a new phenomenon, but the Miratvoris, the Center for Countering Disinformation, Ukrainian propagandists, and their uh, instructors from NATO countries are spreading it not only in Ukraine, but also outside Ukraine. After the beginning of the Ukrainian conflict, the level of hatred towards Russian citizens in Europe and the world has reached unprecedented heights. States are closing entry for Russian citizens. Monuments to Soviet liberators are being demolished in Eastern countries. The rights of Russians are being infringed on for political and Russophobic reasons. Some countries neglect the fundamental principles of world order, ignore legal and political norms, which reflects their historical and cultural terrorism. Vandalism, demolition of monuments and threats reminded of the true face of a number of states for which any country or people who oppose the liberal doctrine is an outcast and an enemy. Ivan Melnikov, director of the Foundation to Protect National Historical Heritage and Lithuanian initiative group, group Imho Club, launched an international campaign to save monuments in Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia and Poland. Trying to abandon and attention, erase or change the past shared with Russia, the authorities of the Baltic and many other countries are ready to neglect the rights of their own residents. So on August 23rd, during the demoli uh, demolition of the monument to the liberators of Riga, local residents decided to gather in Victory Park to lay flowers and take a last look at the memorial. That evening, more than 150 sympathizers gathered near the monument and a few hours later, the local police arrived who immediately began arresting peaceful demonstrators. It's not worthy that there were no people among the crowd who behaved aggressively. It was an action of farewell to the monument. No one resisted the police either. This did not prevent Latvian law enforcement agencies from using force and detaining 19 people, including women and children. Eyewitnesses said that, that the police roughly grabbed the protesters by the hands, pushed and dispersed the crowd. One man was detained for lighting in a candle. The president of the Republic of Latvia said that the dissident people should be isolated from society. And Lithuanian Foreign Minister Edgar Rinkevich did not ignore the situation and said that all detainees should be deported. However, vandals get not only to monuments, anti-Russian aggression directed to Russian shops, embassies and Orthodox churches. The media has also repeatedly reported absurd bans for Russian-speaking citizens in Baltic states. They are banned from visiting restaurants, expelled from schools and universities, fired from work and restricted to move freely on the streets. Inspired by the example of Lithuania, some European Union countries that want or have already blocked the entry of Russian citizens into their territory also support Russophobia. Finnair, Ryanair, Lufthansa staged a witch hunt with Russian passports. Reports continue to arrive that European airlines do not allow Russian citizens on board. The Prime Minister of Estonia said that Russian tourists are a danger and a threat to the security of the country and also called for a ban on issuing visas for Russians who plan to visit EU countries. At the end of September, the Finnish Foreign Minister allowed a ban on the entry of tourists from Russia into the country, saying that Russian vacationers have no moral or ethical grounds for visiting Finland. Those and many other statements, as well as the introduction of discriminatory measures against Russian business, the seizure of Russian property and the exclusion of participation in sports and cultural events by the Western politicians indicate systematic discrimination on ethnic and linguistic grounds. Human rights defenders of the Foundation to Battle Injustice and I, Mira Terada, have repeatedly appealed to the governments of Western country, but since a certain time, all international human rights institutions became deaf and dumb. I hope that by conference it will be able to draw attention to this urgent problem. We will continue to fight against the imposition of non-legal practices in the international sphere and will do everything in our power to close the Miratvoric website. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank EIR for hosting this important press conference uh, in response to the uh, Ukraine Ukraine's uh, CCD's uh, decision to post an updated blacklist. Uh, this one uh, much expanded with a total of 35 Americans and other Western um, political leaders and, and um, thought makers that have uh, dared to uh, 
to stand for peace against uh, uh, further Western involvement in this uh, undeclared proxy war against Russia and Ukraine. Uh, one of those uh, Americans, of course, is Fox News host uh, Tucker Carlson. So uh, that's uh, kind of an interesting development. Just to provide a little, a little background um, for myself, uh, I currently work as a Deputy Director of National Operations for the EMP Task Force on National, National and Homeland Security. And I'm a former U.S. Army Combat Arms Officer. Um, I've worked as an International Programs Manager uh, for the Department of Army Headquarters um, in charge of uh, Armist Corporation, cooperation with the former Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, um, and the Middle East, and a number of other regions as well. Um, I also have two graduate degrees, one of which is a uh, master's uh, in national security studies from Georgetown University. And I'm currently serving as a contributor to the National Interest uh, Foreign Policy Journal. I'm also a contributor to uh, the late Dr. Peter Pry's book, uh, Blackout Warfare, as well as his uh, sequel book, uh, Will America Be Protected, which is due out later this year. Um, and finally, I'm also editor of a newsletter called uh, The Real War, which is available for uh, to read on dpyne.substack.com. So I think it's it goes without saying that the uh, U.S. taxpayer-funded um, Orwellian named uh, Ukrainian Center for, for uh, Countering Disinformation is, is actually one of the main agencies charged with disseminating Ukrainian uh, propaganda disinformation. And the purpose of this organization uh, continues to be to influence, uh, to really to kind of threaten and, and um, blackball any, any um, Western leaders or um, intellectuals who, who dare to, uh, you know, to uh, question the, the prevailing narrative, which, uh, which is being uh, put out by the uh, Biden regime media that, uh, you know, we have to fight Russia. And this is a kind of uh, a huge fight that Ukraine is somehow an ally. Uh, in fact, it's not even, it's not in the national interest at all for the United States to, to uh, be arming Ukraine uh, to fight, fight the Russians uh, because it can provoke Russia to uh, escalate to the nuclear level. It seem, seems increasingly likely against Ukraine, and that in turn could uh, provoke a, a Western reaction that could lead to World War III, which would, uh, could, lost the life, could cost the lives of uh, hundreds of millions of Americans and Europeans, and that's something we desperately need to avoid. So, uh, there, you know, there's been a lot of developments um, the, uh, with the Russian annexation of 15% uh, of Ukraine's territories. I do think uh, uh, Zelensky in particular, uh, the Zelensky regime is becoming uh, increasingly desperate. Uh, they're, they have experienced some success in trying to uh, take back about uh, 6 to 8% of uh, Russian occupied territory. Um, but uh, they know their windows closing with the, uh, the, the full Russian mobilization uh, of their uh, reservists, uh, which is estimated to include at least 1.2 million uh, reserve troops. Uh, once those troops um, come to Ukraine, it, it can increase the size of uh, Russian forces there by um, as much as 600, 600%, 100%. And uh, once that happens, uh, you know, the war is going to be uh, decisively won by Russia, even without the use of, uh, of nuclear weapons. So I think it's really important that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, say we kind of bring, bring back sanity to the discussion. And I, I'm Grateful to EIR for helping to make that happen. And I look forward to answering any, any questions uh, later in the conference. Thank you. Let me also say, because we've gotten a ton of questions, that if there are questions that we need to, for, to forward to particular individuals, uh, we will do so. There are various ways to contact us, uh, which uh, we can put at the bottom of the screen. I'm going to return now to the questions discussions. Uh, and the next person we have is Jeff Young. Now, Jeff Young is the Democratic Party candidate for U.S. Congress uh, from Oklahoma, who is also an independent thinking person. So I want to make sure that he is up there. We've got him now. And Kentucky, Dennis. I'm sorry. I said Oklahoma. I'm sorry. I always do that with you. Kentucky. Uh, I don't like Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> Oklahoma, I have friends. Kentucky, I never had any friends. Oh, well. <laughs> Sorry. So. You have one now. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll take that as a beginning. you got to start somewhere. 
Go ahead. All right. Well, thank you. Um, uh, I would like to answer a question uh, raised about five minutes before noon by Yulia Berg in the, in the question and answer period. And she asked, uh, at this time in history, what can be done and what, uh, what can be done to prevent the um, globalists from implementing their agenda? What alternative is there to the uh, kind of negative globalism that uh, we have been talking about today? First, I wanna thank the organizers of this conference, EIR and the Schiller Institute, it, uh, this press conference, it is uh, extremely valuable. And uh, the speakers have been excellent and they are, they, we are addressing issues that the mainstream media in the West are simply shoving under the carpet. They're not being addressed at all, none of them. So my answer to Yulia Berg's question um, is that, uh, the key is not Germany at this moment in history, October 6, 2022. The key is the United States in Washington, uh, the, uh, the White House and the Congress in Washington, DC, the CIA in Langley, suburb in, in Virginia and the Pentagon in Arlington. Um, Germany at this point does not have agency. It does not have complete sovereignty. As some speakers have already noted, uh, Germany is still an occupied country militarily by the United States. Uh, I am the Democratic nominee for sixth congressional district in Kentucky. Um, as far as I know, no other Democrat or Republican in Washington today, the US House or Senate is aware of the danger that humanity is in at this moment. Um, some third party candidates are aware of it, Diane Sayer and Matthew Ho. Uh, but as we know, third parties don't usually win in America. And so uh, why I am running is to inject some sanity into Washington uh, to make people aware that we are on the cusp of a nuclear war that could uh, wipe out human life on earth forever. Extinction is forever. And um, so what matters, uh, uh, most in my opinion is whether <laughs> uh, the US House will uh, have one pro-peace, pro-diplomacy, anti-war, anti-imperialist, anti-CIA representative in Congress in January of 2023 or zero. We have zero today and uh, if if we if if I lose to the Republican incumbent, um, I don't see any hope for alerting the American people fast enough to uh, basically replace the current imperialist, savage, aggressive warmongering government of the United States, the entire government, before they destroy the world. 
Um, in the best case scenario, uh, they will fail and only the United States and Western Europe will collapse and sink into poverty uh, and the rest of the world will, will proceed and develop fine. In the worst case, the United States, uh, the people who run the United States will decide that, well, if we can't be in power, we're gonna end it all. Thank you again for inviting me to participate today. Thank you very much, Jeff. Actually, I think what we'll do is since you raised an important matter concerning the Congress and anybody who was involved there, um, Harley, I'd like you to speak to that because of course we have some activity, several people are engaged in, and I believe there are some rumblings or signs of something different from the Congress. Well, I, I think we're going to explore that. I mean, we're getting out these calls that people are signing, these petitions, demanding an investigation of why is the U.S. government sending billions of dollars to, uh, for a war in Ukraine when American servicemen and servicewomen uh, don't make enough money to provide food for their children and children have to be on food stamps to eat? You know, there's, there's a lot of anger in the population. And, you know, I, I think the important question is what will catalyze the change? Now, just to say something about Germany, because it was brought up again by, by Jeff, the question of Germany is going to be determined in the next couple of weeks and months because of the likelihood of a cold winter. And you might ask, whatever happened to global warming? But the likelihood of a cold winter and the lack of any kind of electricity to heat homes, cook food, uh, gasoline to travel, and so on. And we're starting to see a process very similar to what happened in 1989 in Eastern Germany. And I think this is something we can look at that is a classic case of what happens when you have a great moment and you find a little people. Well, the little people of Germany took to the streets, of East Germany took to the streets. They were facing the Stasi, a communist dictatorship. And they rose up and overthrew it with lightning speed, but it actually took these Monday night demonstrations to take off. One, one week it's a hundred at a church, the next week a thousand. And we're seeing a similar thing in the Czech Republic. Now, could that happen in the United States? And that's a question that, that is not gonna be answered by the politicians because most of them are already sold out. But, I remember something from 2009 when Obama came in and he spoke to the bankers after the collapse of 2008. And what he said is, I'm the only thing standing between you and the pitchforks. And he went ahead and, and proceeded with the Bush bailout policy. Now, are there gonna be pitchforks in the United States? And I don't mean to encourage violence, but will there this time around be Americans who will stand up and finally say, no, we're not going to fund a war that could become a nuclear war. And it's a question of appealing to the conscience of every single person. And I, I think that's what we're doing with the Congress. We're, we're going to be visiting with some congressmen today, uh, people who are watching this video, download the calls that we have on the Schiller Institute website, sign them, circulate them, uh, take them to your local groups, your, your trade unions, your co-workers, and so on. It's up to us to create that. If you're going to wait for a Democratic movement or a Republican Party movement, forget it. They will respond when they see people in the streets. And perhaps when they see the pitchforks, they'll respond. All right, thank you, Harley. There's a question, Ray, that I'm going to direct at for you. This comes from something from that came in actually during our uh, meeting. There's an Italian general retired named Fabio Mini. And an article appeared, I don't know where it's from, I just have quotes, in which what he was describing was that the statement concerning a nuclear war should, uh, you know, cannot be won, it can never, should never be fought, 
pertains to fights among two nuclear nations, not necessarily between a nuclear and non-nuclear nation. He had a very particular set of formulations here. I just want to get them and see if you have anything to say about this. Uh, he said, um, every theater cam commander, such as the U.S. commander of U.S. forces in Europe, has permanent authority to employ the tactical nuclear weapons at his disposal. Uh, he was suggesting, obviously, that that therefore meant that there was a geometry in which perhaps uh, a use nuclear weapon could be independently used. I'm not saying that's right or wrong. The reason I bring it up to you, Ray, is because two days ago, the National Security Archive called attention to their releasing of uh, previously classified documents uh, pertaining to the Cuban Missile Crisis, which they refer to as the 59-day Cuban Missile Crisis, not the 13-day Cuban Missile Crisis. They specifically had a document by a uh, Colonel Nikolai Bello Borodov. I don't know if I'm saying a B-E-L-O-B-O-R-O-O-D-O-V, Bello Borodov, I think that is. He had written a document in 1998. He was the person that was involved with the transshipment of the original weapons to Cuba. And he states that it was October 4th of 1962 when the weapons first arrived and that the weapons were removed on December 1st, 1962. And that's the reason for the difference of the 59 days. He had a statement in his 1998 document, which has been put up there on the National Security Archive. And this, I'm gonna read it. This is a quote. He said, it was clear, now remember these are weapons placed in Cuba, nuclear weapons placed in Cuba. And he, Barbaradov says, um, it was clear that in the conditions of the existing balance of forces in conventional arms, which was 10 to one against us, there was only one way we could repel a massive assault by using tactical nuclear weapons against the invaders. In principle, this action would be consistent with international law on the protection of sovereignty and freedom, but that would be the beginning of the end. Only madmen could unleash a nuclear war, end quote. So kind of a mouthful there, but I thought I would get it while we're on and this had sort of come in just to get your reaction, both to the general Fabio Mini from uh, Italy uh, and this whole issue of the madness of the use of tactical weapons, but whether or not commanders actually do have some ability to use these weapons. With respect to Europe, uh, the U.S. Army, uh, U.S. Armed Forces were um, willing and able, and it was their, their fallback position if there was a Russian invasion, the Russians did outnumber us in those days, um, that the fallback position default would be to use nuclear weapons, tactical ones, so things like Honest John. And actually, Colin Powell talks about one of his first uh, tours of duty in Europe, and he was just uh, really flabbergasted that uh, he would have, uh, he would be uh, the, the person who ordered the retaliatory uh, force uh, against the Russian invasion. Now, Russia's never came through the Folger Gap. It was a, it was a, a balance of terror, and they knew what was going to be in store for them if they did, and they, they were quite happy to keep their own little socialist paradise, if you will, uh, in the, the, the countries that were under their rule. Now, um, the whole question of how uh, who can authorize a nuclear strike is really really important uh, imagine uh, you're uh, vladimir putin right and you're trying to figure out uh will uh, these crazy people that uh, run stratcom now the former sac uh, that think that oh, tactical nuclear weapons well yeah we may have to use them or these guys out the, the Navy admirals in the Seventh Fleet out in the Pacific, and, well, yeah, or people who write books like the former commander of NATO, what's his name, that little guy, uh, Admiral uh, Stavridis, yeah, 
uh, saying, yeah, well, there'll be a nuclear war with China in six years. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. So here's Putin looking on on this and he's saying, whoa, uh, do, is there any reference material about whether these uh, weapons have been devolved so that some of these crazy admirals or generals can fire them off? And his aides say, well, yes. But Daniel Ellsberg wrote an incredible book. It's called The Doomsday Machine. And it says that contrary to what everyone else believed, there were generals and colonels at the tactical level, some of them stationed in Japan that had, a, had prior authorization. Okay. So we talked a little bit before about uh, Putin not wanting to have just seven to 10 minutes or even five minutes, God forbid, to decide whether to retaliate against these missiles that are coming in, that he didn't know whether they had nuclear weapons on them or not. So just think about that. If Putin uh, has to be conservative about this and has to think, well, you know, maybe these crazy admirals and you know generals, maybe they do have authorization. Maybe it's a default sort of thing that uh, the president can't really react in time. So that's a real problem, okay? That's why we have to address this full on frontally. Uh, and it's not being addressed, it's just most, mostly rhetoric. Now, with respect to the rhetoric, uh, we are hearing every day that uh, Putin has uh, threatened to use nuclear weapons, okay? Well, he did something very unusual right, right when he invaded Ukraine. He reminded us that he had nuclear weapons in the kind of, he, he said, I'm going to put them on, on higher alert. Okay. That was unusual. Russian leaders have not done that in the past. Okay. I've been around for five decades. Okay. They haven't done that in the past. Okay. So that was number one. And number two, what is really a concern here is whether he could uh, use them in Ukraine. There's no military utility to using them in Ukraine. And most important, as for the rhetoric and the principal position that governments take, it's very clear. Russian doctrine says that Russia will use nuclear weapons in just one of two or two circumstances, okay? One is if nuclear weapons are fired at Russia. And number two, if the existence of the Soviet, of the Russian state is, at, is in doubt, okay? All right, so let's just, just, just look at that thing. If the existence of the Russian state is in, in doubt. Now, what is uh, Lloyd Austin, Secretary of Defense? What are they all saying? Well, we're gonna weaken Russia. Our, our real game is to weaken Russia by using Ukraine against it. And Biden says, uh, but we, want, we don't want World War III. But they say, we're going to weaken Russia and we're going to put Putin's back up against the wall. Okay. And then the head of the national intelligence system, April Haynes, says, if you put Putin's back up against the wall, he's likely then, and probably only then, to use nuclear weapons. So, do a little syllogism, you know, you don't have to be real bright to understand this. Uh, why would you want to put Putin's back up? against the wall. It's an existential threat to Putin. Final remark here. You mentioned Cuba, okay? Now, uh, it was a year before my time at the CIA, but I know what happened, okay? We had very confident estimates saying the Russians would never, never put offensive missiles in Cuba because they know how we would react. Typical mirror imaging, crazy for analysis. They put missiles in Cuba, and then we said, well, we found them, Mr. President, President Kennedy, we found them because we got these fancy U-2. Okay, he said, all right, are they armed? And my former colleague said, well, now we, we assess that they're not armed. Now, that's what they use now, we assess. That means what we used to say in the Army, the, fa the swag factor, a scientific wild ass guess, okay? We assess that they're not armed. And what could be more, more important than whether these medium range ballistic missiles 
right targeted on you know major naval bases in, in the East Coast, whether they were armed or not. Well, it turns out, guess what, folks? We learned three decades later, they were armed with nuclear warheads. What am I saying here? I'm saying here that intelligence is a very iffy situation, particularly if you see the word assess. <laughs> okay, forget about assess. You have to talk to these people, and that's what's missing. Final word, during Cuba, JFK, John Kennedy, made sure that Llewellyn Thompson, old Soviet hand, former ambassador in Russia, who had just come back and had talked to Khrushchev, he made sure that Llewellyn Thompson was present at every one of those strategic planning meetings during the Cuban crisis. And so when these crazy generals and admirals say, oh, we can nuke them and only, you know, only, well, retaliation, retaliatory, we'd only suffer about 20 million killed here in the States, right? Well, Llewellyn Thompson said, look, deal with Khrushchev, and Kennedy did. Now, compare that with today. The Russian leaders have given up on dealing with those clowns. And I use the word, um, I, I apologize to my friends that are clowns. But when you talk about Tony Blinken, and you talk about Jake Sullivan, uh, these guys are wet behind the ears. They're elitists. They still think the US is exceptional. And they are very dangerous people because I think they tell Biden what to do. Long story short, nuclear weapons is really important. Don't believe the rhetoric that says Putin is threatening to use them, but do believe what the intelligence people say. April Haynes is a smart woman. She's national intelligence director, and she has told the president in public, if you put Putin's back against the wall, then, then he's likely to use nuclear weapons. That happens to be true. So ergo, put Putin's back against the wall. I don't think that makes a lot of sense. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ray. And I'm going to thank everybody that participated today. We're now up almost on three hours in this session. We, of course, believe that every minute of it has been worth it. And we do and will answer questions if they were afforded to us. Uh, you can contact us, obviously, through our website and otherwise. So I want to thank right now, take the occasion to thank Colonel Richard Black, Helga Sepp LaRouche, Cliff, Dr. Cliff Kirikov, Eva Bartlett, Graham Fuller, Diane Sayre, David Pine, Mira Tirada, Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Broussard, and Harley Schlanger for their participation today. We will not be silenced speaking truth in times of war. Uh, and this will be posted uh, shortly. Uh, so you'll be able to get the full proceedings and review them. And again, if there are questions that come up in the aftermath of this, or you want to in other ways, contact us to participate, please do so. So thank you and good evening.